House will come to order. The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, hope everybody's well rested, well fed, full stomachs. As a public speaker, when I was teaching college, the worst time to be lecturing was right after lunch. So this is the worst position I can be in right after dinner. No, not enough. But this is such an invigorating topic, right? It's invigorating. And so nobody's going to fall asleep because cybersecurity, you know, I know that for some that don't care, their eyes just glaze over within seconds of beginning the conversation. But not with this body, members. I know that. So thank you. Madam Speaker, and where I left off was an article here. It's entitled, Are Connected Cows a Hacker's Dream? And members, we know that the stakes are very high. The stakes are very high in this matter. That's no bull. Humans aren't the only ones consumed with connected devices these days. Cows have joined our ranks. And members, remember, if you recall yesterday, I was speaking about monitoring. And when it comes to monitoring and writing logs, we have to watch for anomalous activity that's no different here. But in the ag field here, at least in this article, it's monitoring. Believe it or not, farmers are increasingly relying on Internet of Things devices to keep their cattle connected. But not to Instagram, but to improve efficiency and productivity. For example, in a case of dairy farms, robots feed milk and monitor cows, health collecting data along the way that helps farmers adjust techniques and processes to increase milk production and thereby profitability. And when it comes to this, why is profitability important? Because in any industry, when there's competition, everybody wants to be the cream of the crop. We know that to be the case. Much like any industry, they have to analyze the market and grab the market, grab it by its horns, grab it by its horns and do the best they can. The implications are massive. As Financial Times pointed out, creating a system where a cow's life, I'm sorry, birth, life, produce, and death are not only controlled but entirely predictable, but have a dramatic impact on the efficiency of the dairy industry. And so one of the things that we need to understand, members, is we can't follow the herd. Nobody can do that. Businesses can't follow the herd. They have to stand apart from the pack. They have to separate themselves. So how do connected cows factor into cybersecurity? That's an excellent question. How do they factor into cybersecurity? Because on one side of the equation, one side of the equation, you have threat actors. On the other side, you have those that are trying to defend the network. And in this ongoing strategy, it's a teat for tat game. Back and forth. And we do everything we can, especially as lawmakers, to try to tip the scales in favor of the good guys, right? Tip the scales in favor of the good guys. By the simple fact that the Internet of Things devices tasked by milking, feeding, and monitoring them are turning dairy farms into data centers, which has a major security implication. Now, data centers, members, data centers, in, uh, Me Representative Meckland is very familiar how Google wanted to come and build a data center. And if you imagine when you drive past these dairy farms, they are vast 
areas, right? In fact, I had mentioned my RV uh, recent purchase, and on the way back, I was actually amazed. I was amazed. Uh, what state were we in? We were driving back from Arizona, because I purchased it in Arizona. We were driving back, and I forget which state we were crossing. But we have, I've never seen more cattle in one spot. We were driving by, and it had, it, it had to be thousands of cattle. It might have been Texas. We did cross through a, 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 the panhandle of Texas. I've never seen more cattle in my life. And it was utterly, utterly amazing. Indeed, a data, indeed, the data collected are stored in data centers or in the cloud environment, which opens farmers up to potentially costly cyber attacks. Think about it. The average U.S. dairy farm is a $1 million operation, and the average cow produces $4,000 in revenue per year. $4,000 in revenue per year, members, that's a lot of money. Now, I did the math, and I broke it down here. That's per year. So one cow at 4,000 of revenue per year, that's $2,714 per day. That's $113 per hour. That's $1.88 per minute that each cow is producing in revenue. That's point, or it's three cents per second. Now why do I break it down to the second? Because when it comes to cloud security, the two top industry leaders right now our AWS, that's Amazon's cloud, and then you have Microsoft's cloud, I've heard it called, uh, given the name, Azure or Azure, depending on how or who is saying it. But when it comes to Azure, as I'm more familiar with, they charge per second, per second. So if you have a server or a virtual, a virtual server, a virtual switch, it's per, down to the second, and so, in the cybersecurity field, the costs are per second, the revenue is per second. So every when or if these robotic machines, robotic milking machines get compromised and they are down, every second matters. Every second matters. But we know that farmers are very disciplined. And when they face unexpected circumstances, they don't have a cow. It would literally be better for an individual farm to pay a weekly 2850 ransom to keep the Internet of Things up. And if hackers were sophisticated enough to launch an industry-wide attack, the dairy industry would be better off paying $46 million per week in ransom than to lose revenue. You know, if something, if, you know, paying, most of us, if we were paying $46 million per week in ransom, that would chap our hides. We would not be happy. So, members, Internet of Things was referenced several times in this article. The Internet of Things, the first time I came across this was many years ago. Some may have heard, I, I think Representative Nash mentioned it yesterday, DEF CON, it's an annual security conference. There's also Black Hat. Black Hat takes place in, in Vegas, Black Hat. I'm not sure if Black Hat is still around, but DEF CON certainly is. And I've been there. And when I was there, You do not want to be in Vegas when Black Hat or DEF CON is taking place. Because those who, do, who know what it is, the world's greatest hackers converge for a week in Vegas. Now when I was there, it was Caesar's Palace. They converge and security is discussed then for that week. The world's greatest hackers internationally. And if you go there, shut your mobile phone off. Do not have your mobile phone enabled. Do not have, I know most of us, when we have our mobile phones on, we likely have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS enabled all the time, right? You'd want to put it in airplane mode as you're walking around because they have a wall of shame. And if you get compromised, your picture, you have nothing to do with the conference, will show up on the wall of shame. 
But in this conference I was at, now members, this is very important, listen to this. The internet of things is just what it sounds, the internet of all things. As we know, every day that goes by, we have more and more innovations that are occurring and things are becoming connected to the internet. And they had, so the one hacker team came in and they were giving a demonstration. And what they did is they took, now I don't have any children, but I know that many in here do have children and you probably have like a stuffed animal or other toys that are Wi-Fi enabled. And they're Wi-Fi enabled, they're connected then to your house network. And what they did is they demonstrated how these toys, unlike standard operating systems like Windows, right? Windows, most of us in here are familiar with that. Each of us has the laptop on our desks. There is a standard patching process. Now what patching is, is it, it's updating. When vulnerabilities are discovered, the vendor pushes out patches to, on a regular basis to patch the, the vulnerabilities, to fix them, to close that vulnerability so that it can no longer be exploited. So when it comes to vulnerabilities and exploit exploitations and hacks, know this, vulnerabilities exist, threats are looking for vulnerabilities to exploit. So one of the things you have to keep in mind is threats exploit vulnerabilities. And so that when it comes to the Internet of Things, unlike standard patching and update processes for common operating systems, when you have things like toys, or robotics, they are not as common in terms of the operating system that operates them. It's the operating system is the software that allows it to run. And so what this team did is they took this toy that was Wi-Fi enabled. The toy, by the way, the reason it was Wi-Fi enabled is not only did it have connectivity to the internet, but it had a built-in camera in the face. I think like the nose was a camera or something to that effect. And then it had a speaker. And what happened is, because there wasn't a standard patching process to update the vulnerabilities, the hackers were able to hack this stuffed animal. By the way, it moved. Did I mention that? So it moved, it, it, would, it would walk and things like that. And so what this, what this team did is they demonstrated how this toy that you have connected and your children are playing with, they compromised it, and the, the threat then, the malicious party was outside of the home, had nothing to do with the family and they compromised it, and because they compromised it, they were able to use the camera on this toy to look at the children to case the home. We know what casing means, right? It's, it's in advance staging to, tr to plan for nefarious activities. So they used the, the toy that was already in the house that had the ability to move and it had the ability to see in the house, and they used it to case the house. The thing that was even more scary, though, is that you could speak to it. So the threat actors, the hacking team, if they wanted to, they can speak to the children and interact. Now I use it as an example because when it comes, so that, that's Internet of Things. So this article is referring to Internet of Things. So think of these robotics now. And we have many manufacturing, I don't remember who it was, but somebody had mentioned Lando Lakes. It might have been Representative Erdahl, yes. Lando Lakes, right? But any manufacturing has the same vulnerabilities when it comes to patching. In fact, the manufacturing plants where these robotics or non-standard operating systems exist are some of the most vulnerable in any industry. Because again, because of the lack of standardization of patching, these vulnerabilities many times go unremediated. And so you can imagine now these, these robotics are hooked up to the cows. And if, the, if they're not getting patched, they're going to be susceptible to vulnerabilities. Now, I, it doesn't say in here if they're connected by a landline, like an Ethernet cable, which would be a Cat 3 in the old days, could be a Cat 5, now it's Cat 6, Cat 7, and that's a category of copper cable. Or the connectivity for these robotics might be Wi-Fi. And if the threat actors compromise in any one of these two methods, the cows may not get milked, as Representative Raleigh was, had mentioned earlier, that these, act, these threat actors that are outside the network 
would have visibility and create chaos within the network without being present. Now, my understanding is that cows need to be milked twice a day, right? Uh, I'm looking at any farmers here, anybody with the cows, can you confirm that? Do they have to be mar milked in the morning and then in the evening? In fact, Madam Speaker, how many times? Twice a day? Three times a day. Oh, it's three times. So imagine the chaos that would ensue if the robotics were shut down. If the robotics were shut down, and what is the consequence? What's the consequence if the robotics are shut down and now you have team or staff? Let's say you are a milk cow facility. You have hundreds, many hundreds of cattle, milk cattle, or thousands, 10,000. 10, if you have 10,000 cattle and your robotics shut down because a threat actor maliciously put a virus or some other type of malware in there, what is the consequence of the cattle if they can only be milked? Let's say they get milked in the morning, but not in, in the midday or the evening. What happens? Think of the implications. Now, if you become dependent on technology, that's one of the reasons why, members, I know modern-day vehicles, many of them have the backup cameras. Right, Madam Speaker, I don't know what you drive, but you probably have a backup camera. And myself and my wife, we both have agreed, do not become dependent on technology. Do not allow the muscles, the skill set to reverse without being able to look or know your surroundings, be cognizant of the surroundings without being able to hit something, right? Don't become dependent on the camera. Similarly, I know on the, si on the, on the side mirrors, they have these indicator lights now when somebody's in your blind spot. Do not look at it, at least that's our philosophy. So you can imagine then in these production facilities, if they have become dependent on technology and there's an outage, seconds matter because money is being lost. And if they don't have the staff to be able to milk that second or third time in a day, what if it carries over? What if it carries over into day number two or day number three? What's gonna happen? Because you, what's the backup? Do you think it's gonna be cost effective to have a one-to-one -one ratio for every robotic system to have a, a, an equal and redundant backup for it that can just be swapped out? If they're down too long, the industry would become butchered. And we just know that's not good for anybody. So here's another article. This one is dated, pull up the right number of pages here. This one is from March 18th of 2021. Robotic milking is latest high-tech tool on dairy farms in South Dakota. In South Dakota. And by the way, members, I know some of them, some members were not in here. What we're discussing here you know what, I should actually recap. I should recap, members, Madam Speaker, because I know that there were members that not in here. I see faces now that weren't in here when I began. So, Madam Speaker and members, Representative Green has the floor, or had the floor, and he was talking about his concerns. And among his concerns, he spoke about cybersecurity. And he, directly or indirectly, reference line 7.13, which speaks about robotic dairy milking equipment. And then, Madam Speaker, Representative Green asked you if I would yield. And then, Madam Speaker, I was involved in my activity here. I looked up, I saw you, and then I nodded, yes, I will yield. You gave the floor back to Representative Green, and you said, yes, Representative Lucero would yield. And then he proceeded to ask me a question. And then you pass the, the floor to me. So that's where we are, members. That's how we got to where we are right now. For those who missed it, I read the article on Paul Harvey, or the, the radio, the late, great Paul Harvey, 
so God made a farmer. Now, I didn't do nearly as well as, as uh, Paul Harvey did. I'm being passed a note here that we're going to be making a motion, or the, the majority is going to make a motion, so I better hoof it in my remarks here. Within the robot, within the, what time do we have here? So I've got seven minutes. Seven minutes. Robotic milking. <laughs> Robotic milking is the latest high-tech tool in dairy farms. Madam Speaker, we want to make sure that malicious activity is very rare, very rare in the milking industry. <laughs> Within each robotic system, cows are trained to move their own through a large rectangular pen split into two sides and outfitted with a series of one-way gates separating areas that are fed, watered, and rested before entering a small gated area where milking takes place. They can be milked up to three times a day. Okay, there we go. Three times a day. As the systems function flawlessly around them, feeding, watering, watering bedding, washing, and milking hundreds of cows day and night with a nary human touch, is what is possible with this technology. Nearly, nearly human touch. My grandmother milked cows with just a bucket and a stool, Elliot said, his Irish accent rising in, uh, as a song. We've sure come a long way, haven't we? Well, absolutely, Madam Speaker, we have come a long way. If robots are milking the cows, that is certainly increasing productivity, but it also increases risk. It increases risk. But along with that risk, if these farmers and the industry is not careful, their entire business might be put out to pasture. Elliot 57 is the owner of Drumgoon Dairy, one of the largest and now most technologically advanced dairy farms in South Dakota. After years of study and hesitance, Elliot made the move into robotic milking in the mid-2020, uh, mid and his first robotic system launched in late 20, uh, January 2021. So this, the time this article was written, this was just a few months ago. The system seeks to make milking easier and more efficient for farmers, but also for cows. Within each robotic system, cows are trained to move on their own through a large rectangular pen split into two sides and outfitted with a series of well of one gated uh, one way gates. So members, I, I could go on with this article, but here's the point. Here's the point. Security is all around us and it has an impact on us. And just earlier this week, Representative Nash hosted a breakfast cereal breakfast here at the House. I don't, Madam Speaker, I don't know if Representative Nash heard me. I unfortunately I didn't, wasn't able to, to attend and participate in the breakfast cereal uh, event that occurred earlier this week. But we all know what we put in our bowls, right? We all know what we put in with our Captain Crunch, our Boo Berry. Our Sugar Smacks. Some of us put skim milk, which I will, it's just white water. I do not drink skim milk. Some of us put 1%. Some of us put 2%. And Madam Speaker, I'm not sure if Representative Nash made whole milk available to pour over the Count Chocula. But if that milk wasn't available, it's really hard to eat your golden grams with no milk. 
And if the robotic systems get compromised and the supply chain is interrupted, there will be no milk in the refrigerators and we can no longer have breakfast with milk. And members, we don't want that. So as a result, I highly encourage Madam Speaker and Representative Green, thank you for the question on the importance of cybersecurity. Because I don't want your children, Madam Speaker, I don't want any member's children to have to eat their fruity pebbles without milk. Dry fruity pebbles are just not the same. We do not want our malicious hackers to interrupt the flow, and therefore we need to move this bill back to committee so we can ensure that our farmers and our robotic dairy producers are adequately, adequately protected. So thank you, Representative Green. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Green. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you, Representative Lucero, for that. Uh, one of the things that I was trying to make the point of here, and I, and I know that uh, sometimes people don't think so, but this is a real point for me. Um, and, and one of the reasons I'd like to see this go back is to try to fix some things and maybe, maybe get a jump on them before they go bad. And, and one of the things that we mentioned uh, briefly this year is the drought. And I've got folks talking to me now where they don't have hay. Uh, and, and they know that their hay ground isn't even going to make it. And so uh, they're, they're asking for help from the state, from me already, uh, to get on uh, the DNR and, and allow them to, to do some uh, hay crops from, on the state land, also in some of the swamps. And, and we could do that. You know, we could do that uh, if we fix this bill. It's not too late to do it. it, it, it it'll go fast. Uh, the cybersecurity stuff, you know, this is, this is real. And, and to bring it home to us, just imagine for a minute, if you will, that we all get paid on the first of the month here and on other jobs we get paid. What if you didn't know if you were going to get that check until the day it was due? That, that it was all up in the air, you just didn't know. And then one day it maybe didn't come. That, that's what our farmers deal with. Only they deal it on a, on a huge scale. And it's real to them. And it's real to us because this is the stuff that, that keeps this state sustained. It keeps our, our bodies going. And so uh, I'm going to end it there. I, I know that uh, there's some motions that are going to be made. But I do hope that uh, we'll take this seriously, uh, get this bill back to committee, and uh, change some of these things, fix something before it happens this time instead of waiting till after it does. Thank you. The Majority Leader, Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move that House File 8 be laid on the table. Representative Winkler moves that House File 8 be laid on the table. All those in, in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion Two. prevails. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that House File 7 be taken from the table. Representative Winkler moves that House File 7 be taken from the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The clerk will report the bill. House, House file number seven, an act relating to higher education. The author of the bill, the member from Anoka, Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Madam S and Speaker. I mean, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Today is my great honor to be before you to present you with the Higher Education Finance and Policy Bill. I am pleased to share many of the House priorities have been included in this bipartisan bill. All Minnesota families deserve the opportunity to access a world-class education, no matter where they live, what they look like. That is why our Higher Education Budget Bill makes investments to ensure Minnesota students are able to recover from the challenges they faced over this past year. And they also are ready to thrive once they, we move through the, the forward in this post-pandemic workforce. In an unprecedented year, it is no secret our students and families have been hit especially hard. Together, we crafted a higher education bill 
budget that serves students and families now and in the future. All Minnesotans deserve the opportunity to achieve their dreams and provide economic security for themselves and their families. We have three key elements in mind as we put the student-centered focus bill together. One, support student needs now and in the future. Improve opportunities for all students using an equity lens and ensuring we have a strong higher education system prepared to meet the needs of students post-pandemic. First and foremost, we are tackling the challenging of rising cost and student debt. This bill makes new investments in the state grant program, which will impact more than 75,000 students and expand access to nearly 3,000 uh, grant applicants. We also recognize that the cost of attendance is only part of the hardships that our students have faced this past year. One significant compromise initiative we have in our final budget invest in fostering independence grant program. This helps our students raised in foster care attend college free of charge. We also heard moving testimony from, te uh, from students about the challenges this year and the need for more, more direct support and student health and wellness. This is why the bill makes new investments in mental health resources and aims to address food insecurity in mental health um, in our college campuses, incorporating the Hunger Free Campus Act. And finally, we are including ongoing investments in a Z degree program, which helps reduce the cost of textbooks and course materials for students. It was important for us to craft this budget with an equity lens. We incorporated recommendations from the Select Committee on Racial Justice. Our committee was intentional about including measures that help address Minnesota's achievement and opportunity gaps in higher education. We know that a core building block of student success is being able to relate to a teacher who identifies with their own lived experience and identity. Notably, our bill includes increased investments to help train and educate more teachers of color and American Indian teachers. We hope this increased investment can help move the needle to hire more teachers of color in our state to better reflect the student body in early childhood through 12th grade classrooms. We also make critical investments and update and align the American Indian Scholarship Program with the Office of Higher Education Scholarship Programs. And that will qualify students for summer term awards and help them graduate faster with less debt. We have kept the provisions that require the Office of Higher Education to report on the transfer movement of students who withdraw from enrollment without completing a degree or a, a credential program. This will provide critical information to help understand the challenges our students face when, tra when transferring or struggling to finish their college degree. We also have kept all the important house closure, uh, school closure provisions. We worked hard this year to make sure students won't have the worry about their futures being upended if the school closes because of negligence or harmful practices. Our higher education bu uh, budget is student-centered with lots of good provisions that will provide critical support to students now while delivering a brighter, equitable, and prosperous future for Minnesotans and their families as we emerge in the, this pandemic. Members, thank you to our, our members of the committee and to all the people who testified and to our, our staff for helping make this possible. Members, I ask for your support and a yes vote. Thank you. The member from Wright, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to make a motion to re-refer this bill back to the Higher Ed Committee. Yes. Uh, so, you know, this process, as I spoke about a few oh. days ago now. Representative O'Neill. Representative O'Neill moves that House File 7 be re-referred to the Committee on Higher Education, Finance, and Policy. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
So members, we've been talking about this process for several days now, and the problem, like I said early on, this feels like days and days ago, but the problem is that we gaveled in, we went immediately to Ways and Means, we heard these four bills, we took no public testimony, we barely had time to even read through the bills or the briefs to kind of grasp what was in these agreements. We had no ability to uh, amend any of these things. Then the next day I had a informational only hearing in higher ed. And to my great disappointment, members, the people that I wanted to ask questions of weren't even in the Zoom room. So yes, was Ohi there? They certainly were. But that just caused me to have more questions because what I thought I knew about certain provisions were in fact not accurate. And, and that just led to long discussions about those provisions. But you know who was not in that room? Remember when I told you before that the higher ed bill basically had three buckets? It's OHE, the Office of Higher Education, it's Men's State, Minnesota State Universities, Colleges and Universities, and the University of Minnesota. Well, two of those three buckets were not even in the Zoom room. And I had a lot of questions because you know what? This agreement didn't look like the House bill. This agreement didn't look like the Senate bill. It didn't look like either one. I'm not sure exactly how we arrived at these, this agreement. But you know who we didn't hear from in this informational hearing? And I did ask. We didn't hear from Minn State. We did not hear from the University of Minnesota. And we didn't hear from the students that it affects. We had heard from students throughout the process. But they didn't even get to weigh in on the final agreement. Minn State didn't get to weigh in on the final agreement, nor did the University of Minnesota. They weren't even in the room. And even if they had been in the room, it was an informational only hearing. We didn't, as members, and there's several of them in the committee that are right around me right now, we didn't even get an opportunity to offer amendments, to offer our input in that sense. So I would absolutely, we have to send this bill back to the higher ed committee to have a proper committee hearing, to have public testimony, to have transparency, uh, to have uh, the ability to talk about amendments. And you know, here's just some of the highlights of things that I was so incredibly concerned about. So we had, when we had it, uh, the bill here in the House, we had a $120 million target. Now the global target was 100 million, so they had to reduce it by 20. But the problem with that is, how that money was dispersed. So the University of Minnesota asked for $46.5 million, right? But they only got $38.5 million. And I didn't get to hear from them, well, what are the, the repercussions of that? So what are you going to have to cut? What are you going to have to change? What are you going to have to? I have no idea. And they're not here. They're not in this room. They can't take up a mic and talk to us. That, the only opportunity we have to hear back from the University of Minnesota and their students and their faculty and anybody else that wants to come and testify is in committee. And we were robbed that opportunity. Yes, do we have a committee here? We certainly did. Did we have public testimony? We certainly did not. And even more concerning was the fact that Minn State wasn't there. Or even the students who we had heard from earlier in the session were not there. And the reason that's concerning is because they had asked for $130 million to recoup some of their loss. Then they dropped it down to just $75 million, but this bill only gives them $56 million. And we freeze tuition. So I, I have no idea. In fact, I asked in committee, but there was no answer because Men's State was not there. How will this affect your campuses? Do you know how many campuses there are in the Men's State system? There's 37, and they're in each one of your districts. You want to know why I know they're in each one of your districts? Is because they're a strategic plan for Men State that you shouldn't have to drive more than 50 miles to get to a Men State campus. So I know they're in each one of your districts, and if they're not directly in your district, they're very close to it. And like in my district, I don't have a Men State campus directly in my district, but I have a high school that send students there and they have an, a, a relationship. So they have CIS, they have other things with, uh, with one of the colleges near us. And they actually hold classes at the high school. So yes, they are in my district and yes, they affect my district and they affect all of your districts too. You know how many students attend the Men's State system? It's over 400,000 students and they're from your districts too.
There are students from your districts attending these universities and colleges. And you know what's so great about the Men's State system? Is that if you graduated from a high school here in Minnesota, that you can automatically enroll, you can get an easy enrollment into a two-year college uh, or technical college or community college. And they do that on purpose, which causes other problems because we have to do remedial things because, you know, unfortunately, there are some school districts in the state of Minnesota that are not quite up to par. There are some that still have a 50% graduation rate, and that causes a lot of problems for Men's State. Now, my districts have a 97, 98% success rate and graduation rate, so they do very well. But that's just my district. But there are districts that are mostly over there that are not doing so well. So that is a big concern. But we didn't get to hear any of that because we didn't have any public testimony in our informational only hearing. So the other thing that is incredibly concerning to me, among many, is that in this agreement, there is no money for additional mental health counselors. Do you know how many students came before our committee and said, we are just struggling with our mental health, struggling with suicide ideation and depression and anxiety through the pandemic, before the pandemic, and now after the pandemic? And there is no money for actual trained professional counselors to be added to Men's State. And you know, uh, we actually, uh, Chair Bernardi and I actually had a, kind of like a little town hall with some of the faculty from Men's State. And one of the things that they talked about at great length was the fact that Men's State's uh, budget kept getting kind of reduced, 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 and so they reduced the number of available faculty that could do counseling or professional counselors. And it really affected their students. And I tell you, we heard one after another, after another, after another. And you know what's not in this bill? There's not a single dollar in here to hire a new counselor. But you know, we didn't get to hear that either. We didn't get to offer an amendment. We didn't get to hear from the students. We didn't get to hear from the faculty. We didn't get to hear from anybody because it was an informational only hearing. This is absolutely critical that we go back to the committee and do committee work. So here's another concern I had, which we talked about in committee, but it wasn't resolved because I wanted to know, well, who is in the room making this deal? Who is in the room deciding all of this? Because we had a very good conference committee. I was really excited to be on the conference committee. I was really excited to serve with some new members, and I'm, I can see them across the aisle right there. And they were really excited to be on the conference committee. And then guess what? When session ended and the conference committees went away, we went to working groups, then all of a sudden it was three people in the room making the decision. Three people decided this. Three people. The chair of the House, the chair of the Senate, and the commissioner of higher ed. And nobody else was in the room. And I know for a fact that I was not in the room and none of the senators on the committee were in the room. They were not except for Chair Thomasoni. So what, what's the result of that? Well, I think that Representative Albright will probably get up in a minute and tell you what's the result, because there was nobody to advocate for a provision that was incredibly important to him and to Representative Pulowski. It's not in there. Why is it not in there? Because I wasn't in the room to advocate for my member. That's the point of a conference committee. But that didn't happen either, and we didn't have that conversation in committee because it was just an information only. And here's something else. As I was reading through this bill at great length, which is what I love to do, I came across something else that I absolutely need to ask OHE. I couldn't believe this was in here because here's why I can't believe that this was in here. Because I asked OHE. I asked them when they were in the room. So when you're doing this new foster program, grant program, for foster kids, which is, is a, a good idea. So if it's the last in dollar, we're gonna help foster kids get an education, that's great. I asked them this. Well, we're giving you nearly $4 million to do this, right? But what happens if there's money left over at the bottom line? Because it's a little hard to get, you know, these kids are, to reach them, to find them, to get them involved. And they said, well, it cancels back to the general fund, just like all the other grants. Guess what's in the language of the bill? That is not what the language of the bill says. 
I'm not happy about that at all. You know what it says? I'm going to read it to you. So it says all of these state grants, so the state grant appropriations, interstate tuition reciprocity appropriation, the child care grant appropriation, the Indian scholarship appropriation, the work study appropriation, the get ready appropriation, the intervention for college attendance appropriation, the student parent information appropriation, the summer academic enrichment program appropriation, the public safety survivors officer survivors appropriation and the foster fostering independence higher ed grant program can if the oh if the uh, commissioner so desires can transfer that money between all of those programs so if that program runs out of money you can just take it from another one if that one runs out of money he's just going to keep transferring all that money until it's all gone it doesn't cancel back to the general fund and you know how much money that is members $494 million. Four, yes, no way. The, the, the Office of Higher Ed Commissioner has the authority to just put $494 million wherever he wants within those programs, within those grants. That is not what they told me in, in committee. I want to go back to the committee and I want him to answer to that because he doesn't get to answer to it here. He's not up there. He doesn't get to pick up a mic. This has to go back to the committee. That is so egregious. I literally asked him that question, and that is not the answer that I got. The language of the bill says he gets a transfer between all of those accounts. And it doesn't stop there. There's more accounts that he gets a transfer between. The commissioner can transfer unencumbered balances from the hunger-free campus appropriation to the emergency assistance for post-secondary students grant. So there's another area he gets to just transfer between as he wants. And that is not what we were told. This is not what we agreed to. This is not some of the, the provisions that we talked about. Some of these things are Senate-only provisions. And even though we asked what was that about, like the mental health awareness, there was very little answer, very, very little answer. There's some explanation in the bill, but the people that would know were not at the table. There are all kinds of provisions in here that we did not discuss, that we didn't have public testimony on, that deserve public testimony. For example, some of these underlying appropriations, these ongoing appropriations, get ready. I have no idea what get ready is. I should ask my representative brother because he's been on the committee longer than I have. I don't know what get ready is. We never discussed it in committee. It's an underlying appropriation, an ongoing appropriation. We didn't even discuss it. There's a few things in here that I do know because I wrote the bill back in 2015 and they're still in here. But again, we did not have any testimony that came forward to talk about how are those programs doing? What is the update on it? It's really disappointing, really disappointing, because you know what, until the final bill comes out like this, you have no idea, is that appropriation going to continue or not? You just don't know. Well, we didn't even have that opportunity because it was informational only, we just didn't have the testifiers at the table. I say at the table, in the Zoom room. The Hunger Free Campus Grant. There wasn't anybody in the room to tell us, how is that working? Is this money even enough? The appropriation in here is only for 205000 for the first year and 102 in the second. I have no idea. Does that go far enough? Is it too much? We didn't get to hear any testimony about that either. We also didn't get to hear any testimony about the brand new program I mentioned about the fostering independence. So it's 238 million just to set up the, or 238,000 just to set up the program, and then um, 3.7 million to cover the grants. And you know that there are 8,000 foster care student or foster care kids in the state of Minnesota, right around 8,000. And I'm not quite sure how many that covers. It's almost four million dollars, but because they weren't at the table to tell us. I know that there are a little over 500 foster care kids currently in the higher ed system somewhere, but we didn't get to find that out. We did talk about 
direct admissions quite a bit. We're going to hear a lot about direct admissions from other people. It's one of those crazy programs that costs a million dollars to do something that we all do every single year without any extra fanfare. We don't need an, a working group of $900,000 to figure out how to send a letter to a high school senior. But that money is in here too. So members, I'd really encourage you to send this back to the committee where we can actually have public testimony, public input. We didn't get to hear anything, and, and I certainly did ask. As you know, I always do. There was no one there to answer those questions. I know I have several other members that have equal concerns. And so, Madam Chair, I'm going to just go to the rest of the folks on the, or I guess we have a Mr. Speaker now. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, to go to others on the list. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Mille Lacs, Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative O'Neill, for moving uh, this to uh, a re-referral to the uh, Committee on Higher Education. This is my first experience at the level that uh, follows what I call K-12, or many of us call it E-12 as well. But uh, what I find to, to be frustrating uh, is uh, in regard to the settlement that has occurred. It's called the Chairs Agreement. So we know it's much like uh, Representative Lucero has explained earlier. It's a one plus one plus one. So uh, we know that Rep Representative uh, Bernardi was uh, present. Whether it was face to face, we don't know, probably on Zoom. Senator Thomasoni, and I presume the Commissioner of the Office of Higher Education. This is not the way I'm used to uh, coming to agreements uh, when we are either in a conference committee or we are uh, in a special session with a working group, which is what I've been used to in the past, uh, a working group that brings together committee members, uh, much like a, a conference committee, uh, but we share ideas. Uh, my experience in negotiating uh, K-12 bills has been sitting with um, members of the Senate and the House uh, Policy Committees in Education and uh, sharing ideas uh, that we think will be of assistance to all of our students. And th this bill lacks that uh, opportunity for those of us, especially who are new to this committee, to have that kind of in-depth discussion. So my questions uh, really arise out of uh, many of the programs that have base funding uh, that uh, I think even Representative O'Neill has mentioned, like the Get Ready. Uh, programs that we have little knowledge of because we really haven't had the opportunity to sit face to face to discuss what the difference is among all these different programs that fall under the Office of Higher Education. By the way, the Office of Higher Education is much like the Department of Education for K-12. It, it kind of provides the framework for the, uh, all the dollars that will flow to the University of Minnesota and to the state college system. And members, as you heard Representative O'Neill say, uh, you know, that's a lot of money that, that flows from the taxpayers of Minnesota to our uh, state college system and to the University of Minnesota. But what I find as I review this proposal and why I think it's really necessary to send it back to the committee for full discussion by committee members is that it, it spreads dollars and programs so broadly. Uh, you would think that there was not a, a real intent in higher education in our state because there has to be every program from A to Z to accomplish what I, I don't think is supposed to be the goal. The goal is not to spread uh, uh, students across programs or 
students who might be candidates for college across programs. I think the intent has to be a continuation of our K-12 system, which means that we're working with the intellect of our students. We're working with the intellect of these who have graduated from college, either through from high school, either through PSEO or through the traditional method, and their intellect needs to be developed. They don't have to be involved in uh, a lot of programs that are going to deviate from that. And, 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 and that's something that we have never discussed in higher ed uh, this session. Uh, and I suppose part of it was because we were on Zoom. But this is a committee that should really sit down and ask ourselves, really, what is it we're trying to accomplish in higher education in the state of Minnesota and across our nation? Is it to, uh, to work with the intellect of the student and to lead them to degrees that are going to produce jobs, that are going to put them on a career path, rather than uh, sitting in the classroom of a professor who is trying to indoctrinate them. And we know a lot of that's going on on our college campuses. And that's very disturbing to me, because it's not an emphasis on intellect. It's not an emphasis on how you learn to think. It's professors teaching our children what to think. And, and that's not a discussion that we've had, and that's a discussion we have to have. And I wish we could still have that this special session, because that's what's really important to the children uh, that, that advance to our college level. Uh, this bill lacks reforms that we should have discussed in, in length about uh, tuition increases, for example. We've had a lot of federal dollars flow to these schools. I know that um, these dollars have, have gone to the institutions, but we don't know what students they have served in reducing tuition or paying for that loss of learning that they had during a COVID. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on administration, just like there is in the Department of Education here in Minnesota. There's so much emphasis on administration. And for OHE, the Office of Higher Education, they are constantly giving out grants. And what is the accountability of those grants? We really don't know. That's a question I did get a chance to ask in the brief time that we get to ask questions on a Zoom meeting. What is the accountability of these grants? And there are millions of dollars in grants that go out. Just think, we have uh, almost 900,000 students in K-12, or E-12, if you prefer. We have, as you heard Representative O'Neill say, just in our state college system, 450,000. So that means, all told, we have had as many as 500,000 students enrolled in our college systems, university or state college system. That's a lot of future uh, employees, future professionals who, who need to learn how to think. How do I analyze? How do I evaluate? How do I synthesize? How do I create? Now, what is it am I supposed to think? But how do I learn to think? And these are discussions that are lacking when we have such a limited amount of time to actually be able to discuss. So another reason for us to sit down and have these really uh, as sincere discussions about what is the goal of higher education for our state? Are we really trying to improve the intellect of our children? And then as I said previously, all the base funding that's going on, program after program after program. Members, this is not a short bill. This is a, a, a bill that has um, about 70 pages uh, in the printout that I have, but most of it is various little programs that, that students or uh, aspiring students can take care of. So when it comes to third reading, I'm going to have lots and lots of questions of Chair Bernardi about some of these either programs that are in the base or new programs. And the other thing that really frustrates me is the, the, the use of, of verbiage in, in our um, proposals, and you've heard that talked about in, in regard to other bills in, in this special session, that the, the verbiage, the words that are used are, uh, are, 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 are not clear, they're not succinct. Think about what Representative Lucero was talking about in regard to cyberspace security. 
You, you have to have a discussion about what is this specific word that's really going to be meaningful to whether it's a program or to uh, a, a new creation of a program. Uh, I'm frustrated that rural school district definition has been changed without any real understanding of what a rural school district is and how there is a differentiation among our rural school districts that makes no sense when it comes to our teacher grants and shortage areas. Or, or an, another area that, that there's a question about is what is a shortage area? Because this bill, members, is, is giving grants for uh, uh, our uh, teacher candidates or student teacher candidates or aspiring teacher candidates or to young people who are still in high school to get ready for college. And definitions are really important, that there be specificity and that there not be confusion between K-12 and higher ed. And that is not something that we were able to discuss in this committee. So members, with that said, um, and with my uh, having many more questions to ask when it comes to third reading, uh, I would uh, uh, ask that we uh, return this bill to the Committee uh, on Higher Education so we can really have an in-depth discussion of what is in this proposal before we pass it out of this chamber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Speaker. The representative from Sherborne, Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also uh, rise in support of returning this, re referring this to the Education Committee as there was, as it's been mentioned, there was many, many times that the questions weren't really allowed, we didn't have time. There was one committee hearing, this was the only committee hearing that we had the entire year in Zumbaya land that once did let us go over time. I give that fact credit because we were always told we could not go past the hour and a half and I believe there was one about halfway through that went 15 minutes over. The one and only time. There are many questions that come to mind, and we, you know, had gone through all this, not being able to do uh, amendments in these informational-only committee hearings. And as Representative O'Neill said, when the, when, the, the, when the staff members from the U of M and or Men's State weren't even there to be able to answer the questions, um, it makes it even more challenging. I've had the privilege of, of serving on this committee, something that I never thought I would even know about because I never went to college. Uh, I paid for one young man so far that went to be a Bemidji Beaver. I don't know if I've told you that before. Um, and now we are f uh, looking at sending Sammy to college and luckily for the education industry, she wants to be a biology teacher, which kind of surprises me, she doesn't like blood. In, in, in all that, um, but she's enjoying herself right now in Yellowstone without her father, by the way. So. There is so much to this whole bill and so much that I can learn, and I've learned quite a bit from Representative O'Neill, Albright, uh, Representative Erickson, Creshaw, Daniels. They've done a lot of this education stuff in the past, and it is truly a learning privilege to, be, to learn this underneath them. The questions they ask are things that I never would have thought of because it's completely all new to me. What I did learn is, holy Christmas, do they have a lot of money that the state gives them. Yet they keep raising tuition, and I wonder where does all this money come from, and why do they keep asking the kids for more? I keep hearing kids say we need for tuition forgiveness, and they keep asking for more money, and I'm asking myself, how does any of this make sense? And I and then I get a I get a, a call from a constituent. I think it was about two weeks ago. I wish my LA was here. He would be able to answer this question for me. A young man who is a PSEO student. He is going. He's done two years. He did this his, the second year through St. Cloud State. He will be starting St. Cloud State as a junior this coming fall. He is required to live on campus and buy a food plan because he's outside the 35 mile radius, which will cost him an extra 10 grand he does not have. So they asked us to look into it. Why, why do they do this? Well, they started this, I believe it was December of 2019, which I find really ironic because I think it was 2019 when they closed one of their largest dorms. He would not live there anyway. He would just simply pay the 10 grand because they want him to stay at home and commute. Why is that 10 grand needed? I thought we wanted to make college affordable. These are a lot of questions that need to be asked. I have pages and pages of questions here. Um, and a lot of this stuff, you know, being new to it, it's not something in my background. The only time I learn about it is when I'm handed a bill for the, one of the kids. And then when you get to this side of it, and you see how much money the state puts into all this, 
I think Representative Albright's going to talk about this almost million dollars to figure out how to send high school students a letter when each and every one of us send them a letter every year. We sign them, congratulating them. Maybe they should just come to us and get the list. And I believe Mr. Albright, Representative Albright's going to talk about a plan that he had that I'm very passionate about. It is getting people into the trades. For the last seven years, I have advocated heavily. Kids, you do not need to all go to a four-year degree. Some of you a five-year degree. I went through that once with Andrew because <laughs> he told me I was wrong until after a year that I was right. So, lots of questions. And this all should really be done, as Representative O'Neill said, when those questions need to go to the staff people, whatever their titles are, of the U of M, of Men's State, and all the rest. Credit for pri uh, pr prior learning is something I'm pretty passionate about. When, when, when we first, when Sammy was coming, we had the decision, does Angela leave her job? When she started that job, it was with a major corporation we all know about, somebody I deal with in one of the other committees right now. When she got the job, it required a two-year degree. In her tenure there, they switched to a four-year requirement. If she left, she could not go back. It was a very good paying job with very good benefits. Ironically, 16 years since, whatever it's been, they now don't have zero requirement for education because they'll accept life history and life experience. Because they found the four-year degree didn't necessarily get them a better employee. In the world of trades and tech schools, I asked my neighbor, he's a master electrician, uh, much like Senator Rarick. I asked him about two years ago what he would hire a person right out of St. Uh, Cloud Tech right now. He told me 20 bucks an hour. So I asked him, because there's all these kids complaining about tuition debt, what would you pay a young person out of high school right now? He said 25. I said, I think you got that backwards. He said, no, I didn't get it backwards. In the world of trades, this is not the first time I've heard it either. His answer was this. It takes me a year to untrain them and retrain them. Often what we learn in books, and I do this with continuing it every year, and I'm sure Jason's had it, Senator Rarick has had this in their training. Often what's in the book does not always apply in the real world. Codes change, uh, procedures change, mandates change. And so there is a lot you have to undo and then redo. So I don't know. 50 grand a year, not spending anything on tuition. Within three, four years, you're probably up to 70 or 80, maybe even 100. Or you can go 200 grand in debt. So there's my little rant, my little vent. And we can get to these questions later. There's a lot of them. I mean, there's pages. So, um, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask for a roll call. A roll call being requested. Do I see 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Scott, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Speaker, sorry, it's been a long day. You know, one of the things that I think uh, we often don't observe is the context in terms of what a higher educational opportunity should look like as opposed to what it looks like today. I want to thank uh, the members of the GOP caucus uh, for supporting our work on higher ed, especially Representative O'Neill, uh, for her endeavors to uh, shed light on what's come to be known as the, you know, kind of the quiet committee, but it has great relevance to our state. As Representative O'Neill uh, elaborated, there are basically th two institutions that we rely upon to educate our young adults, University of Minnesota and the Minsk system. One of the first things that I have observed, and this is my second a term serving on higher ed. I served on it a couple of terms to go uh, when uh, Representative Nornis was still in uh, the legislature. 
Um, he taught me a lot. Uh, he gave me a, a wide bandwidth to understand what the spreadsheets look like uh, for both of these institutions. I also uh, want to credit Representative Pulowski for a number of uh, sit by the desk and, and learn from another individual who has great concern for our higher education institutions. And one of the things that we often observe as we start the biennium is taking a look at their budgets. And why is that so important? Because we spend an awful lot of money and we're trying to make sure that we get value value that is going to support taxes, communities, other educational opportunities, entrepreneurial sets, starting new businesses, jobs, philanthropic endeavors, and ultimately growth for the whole state that will shine, if you will, out from here to the rest of our states around us. I don't think that we would get a very good report card if we graded ourselves right now based upon what I've seen over the last several years. And here's why. The first thing that I want to talk about, why I think this should be re-referred back to committee, and thank you, Representative O'Neill, for bringing that, and I do support that, is that we spent an inordinate amount of time talking about 19th century and 20th century learning. We take them into classrooms, and we, to we talk to them about rote repetitive learning and memorization, and we also tell them about what they should know to get a job. But we don't teach them critical thinking in terms of how they should go about their life. I have an article here from uh, a gentleman who has made his life's ambition trying to break, uh, break the paradigms. You might recognize him by the name of Elon Musk. He doesn't hire MBAs anymore. Why? Because all they're trying to do in, in, uh, in the master's programs at these institutions, and I would dare say that it's probably somewhat similar at the Carlson School, is how to get a job. How to get a job. We have come to appoint members in this country and in this world where a resume no longer gets you a job. What gets you a job is your experiential learning. In most cases, it used to be, was for me, that where I worked told my future employer what kind of employee I might be, whether what be at IBM or, or, or Goldman Sachs or any number of companies. And the larger the institution or the more credible the institution was, the greater the import that you wanted to make sure that you had a very high-profile placement on your resume. No longer. If you take a look at Apple, if you take a look at Google, if you take a look at Amazon and any of the other country, uh, companies who are literally leading our nation and this world in terms of growth of jobs and technology, they are hiring people that are critical thinkers, that have innovation as the core of their competency, and they want to have a wide-ranging diversity of experiences backing up that hire. And in most cases, that comes with a two-year degree or a certificate of competency in an area that's very, very important. So when we say that a four-year degree and the institutions that provide those are the all-important manner in which we fund, and that's what we do in higher ed is, you know, how do we pump those out? We didn't do that, and we aren't doing that. To tag along with that, both Minn State 
in the uterus Minnesota are spending an inordinate amount of time worrying about their buildings. They come to us with their own M requests. It also comes in the, in the form of the bonding requests. We are teaching people based upon sitting behind a, a desk in a chair or in a stadium classroom and helping them understand, again, how to learn based upon 20th century thinking. If you take a look at any number of institutions around this country, that is a dinosaur just waiting to be identified for who it is. You take a look at the University of Phoenix, University of St. Thomas, and others that I'm familiar with, online learning is taking the four in terms of degree granting programs. They're just as, incredible, just as important, they're just as incredible. The problem is that I don't believe that either one of our two core institutions are really emphasizing those. That is, a, that is a, a duty and a responsibility for them to undertake to make sure that we are providing a workforce for our state that is prepared. Prepared for the, the needs of our employers and needs of our state. To that end, I draw your attention to another article that I just uh, clipped. I'm in the mood of clipping uh, articles when I find relevance. And this one is entitled, The Crisis of Unemployed Graduates. I'm just going to read a couple things because I think it's important that they are read into the record. Providing students, regardless of their major, with the skills that employers are seeking should be part of every academic department curriculum. For example, psychology, a perennially popular major with more than 100,000 graduates a year, is a field with limited prospects for those who don't pursue advanced studies. But a psychology major who acquires data analysis skills through research or internships can unlock more than 100,000 additional entry-level jobs paying an average of $60,000 versus $39,000 for psychology majors overall. This comes from the Wall Street Journal. The pandemic has done nothing but to exacerbate this issue and expose, candidly, the inadequacies of our institutions, and I would draw our attention to our two core institutions on this very issue. And I quote, preparing for the next emergency, wherever it arises, will require investments in healthcare, biotech, Representative Raleigh, you'll be intrigued by this one, cybersecurity, green technologies and infrastructure. It's a tough market for any graduate from any institution, but institutions that fail to deliver will become as imperiled as students whose future they ignore. That is our responsibility. That is the responsibility of that committee to prepare students for relevant jobs through the institutions that we fund. You want to take a look at what's foundational to our state and what has really made us into the state we are. We spent a lot of today talking about agriculture. And you think about the number of institutions that are household names. Places like CHS, which used to be Senex and Harvest States until it came together. Two cooperatives, by the way, that were born out of agricultural need. Cargill. You think about Hormel. A little side note story. I knew the owner 
of Genio Foods. His name was Earl Olson, out in Wilmer, Minnesota. Side note, the reason that Genio Foods was named so is because Earl and his wife had five children, four sons and one daughter. And they came home one night, Earl, after a long day, and he said, I don't know what to name our company. I got, you know, a lot of things, and his wife leaned across the kitchen table and he says, well, you've got five sons, but you've got one daughter. You better make it right. Her name was Jennifer. And Jenny O. Foods was born. Now, here's a man from humble beginnings out in Wilmer, Minnesota, who decided to grow turkeys. But because of his ambition, a little luck, but also some timing, he sold that company to Hormel a number of years ago. And they are continuing on that name. But you think about places like Hormel and Genio and what they have provided to the state. But also, think about what our institutions, I think about Southwest State, Mankato State, uh, we used to call it Mankato State, now it's Minnesota State Mankato, and other institutions that have provided those companies with, with students and graduates that can do the job. And the jobs that they have had over the years have changed. The jobs that Hormel, and Genio Foods, IBM, Target, Dayton's, Cargill, Sermotics. We have a little bit of a, you know, uh, more than just a little. We are the unknown, quiet uh, med tech company uh, in the upper Midwest. But I dare say that we often forget where those graduates should be trained. They should be trained in our institutions. And are we doing them a fair shot by providing them with an opportunity to succeed? Engineering. A lot of people think about the uh, University of Purdue, University of Mich Michigan, Caltech. Uh, we've got a couple of institutions on the East Coast for engineering. But I dare say that if you ask anyone in the upper Midwest where the best chemical engineers are, are, are trained, it's the University of Minnesota. Are we doing them justice? Are we providing our institutions, our companies, with the best talent, the best trained talent that is possible? I just saw one of our representatives from the Iron Range walk past. I think about taconite. I think about the, the new pellets that were created at the University of Minnesota. In some cases, sadly, I think we have forgotten what the Iron Range provided to this state. This bill doesn't address that. At best, it pays lip service to them. But when you think about the needs that this state and this country and this world will have, technologically needs for materials over the next hundred years. And you start to consider where those resources, both in material and talent, are going to come from. It's Minnesota. Representative Murphy sits over there, and she knows exactly what I'm talking about because she's nodding her head. We cannot forget what the Iron Range did to provide money and philanthropic opportunities for the University of Minnesota as well as Minn State. I've heard it said, and Representative Mecklen hit it on the head. Nobody. Not everyone needs a four-year degree in order to find a successful life. 
I'm familiar with a company that is based out of uh, Flying Cloud Airport, Thunderbird Aviation. Do you realize that in the next five years, 25% of the airline pilots in this country will retire that haven't been furloughed or will retire on their own based upon the current circumstances? Do you also realize that fully 25 to 30 percent of all the airline mechanics will retire in that same time frame? They don't need four-year degrees. They need a place to learn a trade. And if you drive up Highway 100 towards the Crystal Airport, there is a base there that could not only train airline mechanics, but also pilots. Why aren't we thinking about that? This bill doesn't address that. Now you might say, Representative Albright, why didn't you bring these ideas forward? To some extent, I'm, I stand guilty of that, right? But in this environment, where everything is a, you know, a Brady Bunch Zoom call, you have no opportunity to work on some of these things because you are so detached from the opportunity to have spontaneous conversations with any one of the people that would benefit from those, no more, much less your members, either side of the aisle, you can't get much done. And so here we are, talking about woulda, coulda, shoulda. We will have an opportunity to talk about amendments. We will have an opportunity to talk about issues <clears throat> that face our state. There are a number of initiatives in this bill that I've never seen. There are a number of Senate proposals that are included in this bill for which I don't have answers in terms of why they were included. We talk about the report that was put out some time ago about the disparities in our systems. It's a good report. It's a good report. I've read it twice. But if that's the case, and if that's a priority for the majority, why are we paying it barely lip service for funding aspiring teachers of color scholarship program? If it's an important priority, wouldn't you think that you'd have backed it up with funding? I spent a lot of time in Health and Human Services. I've been here almost nine years now. And in Health and Human Services, as many of the members on this floor who have participated in those committees as well, we often deal with three different people groups. The first are those in the dawn of life the ones that are just getting started. You could consider K through 12 and, and higher education, those folks. You think about people in the twilight of life, those that have seen their careers come and go, and now they're enjoying the fruits of their labor. The third group is the one that typically is forgotten or, or not, not dismissed, but those that are in the shadows of life. When you take a look at what has happened during COVID to our students in the higher ed system, they have fallen prey to some of the most egregious mental health scenarios imaginable. Suicide, abuse, isolation, 
to name a few. And this bill, in my opinion, again, your words don't meet your actions. If you take a look at the concerns for students on each one of our campuses, what are they most concerned about? Safety, paying the bills, getting their laundry done. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> but if we talk about security on our campuses, why isn't that an emphasis in this bill? Now you might say, well, we're funding more than what they asked for, and they can take care of it. The dilemma with our chartered uh, grant land-grant institution is that we can suggest that they do some of these things, but they don't have to. They don't have to. And for the gem or the north star of our state, that should be a priority, and we should make sure that it is in writing. We talk a lot about the cost of health care. Now, you're going to hear me say this a couple times, so don't be shocked, but you're doing nothing to reduce the cost of health care. You put a max on tuition increases. I spent 25 years in the financial services business, and any time that someone said, this is how much, this is the most I'll pay, that's what you charge. If you put a max amount on anything, it gives that institution license to move it right up to the max. Because you've allowed them to do that. There is no proclivity in there to say, oh, I guess we better drop our rates, or we better look at cost cutting. No. You can expect both institutions to figure out a way to come right in at 3.5% every year. And then, as Representative Mecklen said, parents are going to be shocked when the bills come due and they were told that tuition was going to be frozen and it's going up 3.5%. This is coming out of the last 16 or 17 months where folks didn't have a job, may not have had a home, worried about putting food on the table, Worried about paying for the health insurance then, God forbid that what's going to happen in the next 18 months, because you are going to raise the cost of insurance by not reissuing reinsurance. And these are the things that keep moms and dads awake at night. How am I going to make sure that little John, not, not little anymore, my young son or my young daughter is better off after they graduate than I was. Does that require a two-year degree? Does that require a four-year degree? Does it require a master's degree? And where best to take care of that? I would hope that their preferential desire would be to stay in state and, be, and utilize our institutions as opposed to those in Wisconsin, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska, 
Montana, Colorado, Michigan, Illinois. Those are basically just the schools that my daughter went and took visits on. I'll tell you a little bit about her experience. Graduated from high school, wanted to be a veterinarian. We drove out to Montana State. That's a really long drive. Beautiful country. Had everything. I mean, you can't imagine the food court at Montana State. It looks like the state fair. We spent 12 hours on that campus, went out to dinner that night, got up the next morning, went over to the financial aid uh, study group, I guess, if you will, how to fill out the forms. Got done with breakfast, and she turned to my wife and I, and she said, I don't want to go here. I had just spent so many hours driving, I wanted an answer before I got in the van and drove home again. And I said, honey, why? And she said, it just doesn't feel right. Right? I said, okay. I came back. We took a look at St. Cloud State, Duluth. Didn't feel right. And I said, okay, we're going to go to my alma mater, Moorhead State. Got to find something good there. She says, well, while we're up there, let's go to North Dakota State, too. So Representative Murphy's smiling because she knows the answer. Went on to North Dakota State campus. She walked up in front of the bison. She turned around to me and she said, we, mind you, we had just parked the car, gotten out. I hadn't even gotten done with my second cup of coffee. She turned around me, she put her hand on the mane, and she said, I want to go here. <laughs> what? And I said, huh? You haven't even looked at the campus. She says, I know, but it feels right. She just graduated with a, a, a major in uh, animal science and a minor in genetics. Proud Papa. She didn't go to my alma mater, that's okay. She could be a bison, I was a dragon. But the point is, and we're going to get this, uh, we're going to drive this point home a little more when we get to the amendments. Kids need to know that there's opportunities. They need to know that there's opportunities in Minnesota. We need to encourage them to research and look into those in Minnesota. And if it doesn't feel right, let's find out why. We are sending and exporting too many of our students. By the way, there are 62,000 students that graduate in Minnesota every year from 12th grade. We're losing a lot of those to other institutions who do a better job of making it feel right. Whether that be through safety, they feel safer, their curriculum is more attractive. I mean, my daughter, my oldest daughter, went to Winona State. Representative Pulowski, if you're listening, kudos. This was seven, eight years ago. She walked out on campus, and the first thing that I handed to her was a laptop. For all of her classes, everything was paid for. Part of her tuition that I was paying, but she didn't have to put out extra. And any time that something went wrong with any of the software or that computer, she took it to a lab and they fixed it for free. And at the end of her four years, 100 bucks, and it's hers. $100. Everything on there, including all the software updates and everything. Are we doing that? Are we thinking 
the way that students need to be thinking these days in terms of amenities, opportunities, and safe, safeguards. Now, Representative Raleigh, you scared me to death when you started talking about this Bluetooth thing, because I know all too well that my daughters and my son, when they were in college, went into all manner of places, and I sure hope that our universities listened to your remarks. Because if there's any place where you could really mess with not only the student, but their family, and if that family owns a business, and their personal affairs, going through a Facebook or a LinkedIn or their student account. And I've done a little cybersecurity uh, you know, work in my past, and the entrance points for someone just roaming around the cam or a campus could be the security camera. It's unbelievable. Another reason why this bill should be re referred back to committee, because those things have not been talked about. We have a problem in this state, and there was another article this afternoon about crime on our campuses. People do not feel safe. And who can blame them, right? You've got a dysfunctional leadership at the top hamstringing law enforcement and the police squads in terms of what they can and cannot do. Why? I would really like someone to help me understand. Because if there's one thing that mom and dad want to know with absolute certainty, when they send their daughter off to college in the car, fully packed for the fall semester of their freshman year, is that they're going to come home in one piece, not crying and not being called in the middle of the night by a law enforcement officer saying, I'm sorry, sir, but your daughter's been involved in blank, blank. You fill it in. We pay good money to make sure that our students are supposed to be safe, both in their data, but also in their person. And we are failing them. And to the extent that this bill and our assistance in encouraging our land-grant institution or Min State to take on and take care of business This bill fails them. We talked a little bit about mental health. We talked a little bit about law enforcement. We talked about the cost of rising educational costs. We talked about who's teaching them and who's not. We're going to talk a little bit about what they should be teaching, what they shouldn't be, because we are in the 21st century. We talked about the jobs that are opportunities out there, whether they be in cybersecurity, in data management. You hear a lot about supply chain economics, about agriculture, about medicine. These are things that, while they are in this bill, there are so many things that are missing. I uh, spent a lot of time in my career walking the floors of factories, enrolling the participants 
and their employees in, in their retirement program. One of the first things that I was faced with, in most cases, are four-year degreed program graduates who were financially illiterate. Didn't probably know how to understand their pay stub. Didn't understand what retirement planning looked like. Didn't appreciate what health benefits they were being provided or offered. Didn't understand that it was up to them to enroll and take responsibility for their own retirement, their own health insurance if it wasn't offered through the employer. Our higher educational institutions are failing our students in that regard as well. And that comes from firsthand experience. It sounds silly and it sounds trite, but when you walk into a car dealership and you're negotiating on a car and you get passed over the table the fair disclosure in terms of what that loan is going to look like for the next six or seven years. And their eyes glaze over like a deer in the headlights. That's rudimentary economics. You know, you take a look at the test scores and what people were expected to know in the 1800s, farmers. Good Lord, now we have programs in this bill that we are funding to get them ready to take college classes. How is that acceptable? How are we accepting that as a state and as a legislature that we don't even have freshmen that are ready to be successful at college. Talking of college, I went to a junior college when I first got out of high school. Golden Valley Lutheran College. Another member of this chamber also attended that. He goes by the name of Representative Lilly. He and I were classmates. He turned out way better than I did. <laughs> but the point why I bring that up is because not everyone goes to a four-year degree program or a four-year institution. If you take a look at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis campus, shout out how many people are going to that campus. Is it like 11,000? For folks like Leon and I, and to my right, this is, this is dating myself, but Representative Olson, his dad and I, went on a choir tour together. I sang bass. I can't remember if your dad sang tenor or bass. Bit baritone, OK. I might get in trouble if I tell that story. MnDOT wouldn't like that one. Yeah, it's more than seven years ago, isn't it? OK. We were on a choir tour. Is your dad listening? OK. I'll wait until I hear. Yeah. I'll go back to the point, though, that I chose to go to junior college. And I, I suspect that Representative Lilly would say the same thing. Because for me, I was so sick and tired of going to school when I graduated from high school that I didn't want to go to college. But some friends that were already there invited me up for homecoming weekend, and we stayed in the dorm. I went to a, a choir concert. 
fell in love with the place and the rest is, is history. Um, but the total population of Golden Valley Lutheran was just a little over 600 students, right? It gave me an opportunity to get my feet wet, immerse myself, and, and hopefully not get lost in the crowd of a theater seating, you know, English 101, right? I felt important. I felt, I felt identified. There are a number of institutions around this state that try to do the same thing for a variety of reasons. I want to draw your attention right now, actually, to one of those that Representative Daniels and I have had the great honor of supporting and participating in the success of their, their students, and that's the Minnesota Independent College. When we talk about those people that have an opportunity and they want to make the most of it, MICC is there to provide that to them. A couple of years ago, we provided them with funding that provided an opportunity for an expansion on the number of students that could participate in that program. It is due to run out in a few years, I think at the end of 24. I really hope that in this legislation or in future legislatures, we think about the important impact that our work here could do to change the lives of so many people at MICC. Shout out to all my friends at MICC. Back to the story. Mr. Olson, you're going to have a chuckle. So we were on choir tour in Phoenix, Arizona. We take a Greyhound bus down there. We had hired a Yellow Medicine bus company to drive us down, two huge buses. I'm the president of the choir. We wake, I get a knock at the door on the morning that we're supposed to leave, and it's the, the I guess, we, the manager of the choir. And he says, the bus driver's sick. He can't drive the bus today, and we have a choir concert the next day. I think it was in El Paso. What's that? Yeah. And he said, what are we going to do? So we, we huddle up the, the, the seniors in, in, on, the, on the choir, and we say, they all looked at me. He said, well, you've got a bus license. <laughs> drive the bus. Now, this is a full Greyhound bus. You don't have, you know, at the point that you didn't had, hadn't run air brakes or anything or anything. So literally 60, 60 individuals, freshmen and sophomores in college, including Bjorn's dad, placed their lives in my hands for 12 hours well, I drove a bus through Phoenix rush hour traffic in the morning and drove into El Paso rush hour traffic in the afternoon. Wow. But that's an experience that you wouldn't typically get if you went to a four-year institution. I, I had an advantage in going to a two-year because I really found myself, as I, I'm sure others do, I hope that we're providing that opportunity to those people. We have a task in, in front of us that is larger and more needful than what is in this bill. When you consider that 201 legislators come together to craft a budget that covers every area of a person's life, whether that be public safety, judiciary, taxes, health and human services, jobs, the arts, legacy, bonding.
And these bills have been determined to be bipartisan by virtue of the fact that there was a Repu one Republican and one Democrat in the room. Friends, that is not bipartisan. That is paying token lip service to the job that we have been elected to do. This is a debate that we need to have. This is an opportunity for us to have a better discourse and a better response to the needs of the state through this bill. We have all night. So let's engage in a proper conversation. Let's send this back to committee. Did you think I was done? You can sit down. We want to talk about such things as safety. We want to talk about such things as opportunity. But why aren't we also talking more about that cost for education and why kids feel it needful to take out loans and go into debt before they ever pick up that first paycheck? Do they really understand the opportunities or the avenues available to them before they take that loan out? Or, going back to the financial literacy issue, do they really understand that when you sign that loan agreement, that's your responsibility? It's no one else's. And just because you can't find a job, or COVID hit, or you've got to work two jobs to pay the bills, to pay that loan back, that's your responsibility. You put your name on that loan agreement. Why should I, or anyone across the state, feel encumbered to help you? Now, that may seem harsh, but the topic of, or the top of the mantle for our chamber is reason is the life of law. Reason for yourself. Just because you feel it's important doesn't mean it's right. Taking on debt is a huge, enormous responsibility. Don't take it lightly. And if you sign that agreement, get help if you don't understand the provisions. Don't sign it until you know what you're signing. Call your mom or dad. Seek out counsel that makes you comfortable to say, I didn't know that, or I, I can't pay that amount back, or okay. I've read the provisions, and I'm okay with that because that's where I'm headed. Debt relief and debt counseling is addressed in this bill. But at the same point, isn't it a bit of a paradox when you're, tr you're providing uh, loan counseling and debt counseling at the same time while tuition is going up? Maybe the first decision that some of these students should be making is whether or not they should go to college at all maybe a trade school, maybe going into a certificate program. There are 9,000 openings right now in the cybersecurity field that you can get with 16-month to 22-month certificates, no debt, because in most cases, the companies that are offering those jobs will pay your tuition 
And the result of getting that certificate is that you walk into a job that starting pay is anywhere between seventy-five and one hundred thousand dollars. I think I should quit and go back to school. These are the issues that are resident in this chamber right now that we are not addressing in this bill. We are trying to put a Band-Aid over a gusher of a wound, and we think it's going to be okay. As has been said before, sometimes you have to root out deeply the infection to cure the patient. And we have not accomplished that in this bill. We are placating our two major systems. We figure if we throw enough money at it, if we make up more programs, I think I identified three programs that are going after the same focus. Aren't they a little bit redundant? Why not put one together? One of the other issues that I find suspect, and I've talked about this in committee, but we don't seem to get much further than that, is the homogeneity of our systems. Now granted, I understand if you're going for liberal arts type of degree, you just want that BS or that BA and you get on with your life, that's fine. But I want to understand why we can't have centers of excellence at various situ sites around the state of Minnesota. If you take a look at what's happening in Winona right now, they are the template for success. They have buy-in from private enterprise. They have buy-in from administration. They have buy-in from the students. Why? Because they recognize when they go to Winona State, they will receive exactly the type of education they're looking for to accelerate their success in their career. Why can't the same be true at other sites around the state of Minnesota, whether that be St. Cloud, Duluth, Morris, Grand Rapids, Moorhead, Mankato? Why isn't the opportunity given to encourage partnership with the businesses in those areas to exploit the talent at the private enterprise to teach the courses. You find talent that way. You find opportunities to adjust your, your teaching and you might actually find insight from the students in terms of how you could do your job at the business better. But we are so insulated against innovation that I find it frustrating when we sit in committee and we hear that it's always got to be this way because we've got to be the same across the system so that we can be everything to everyone. Members, we are at a crossroads, particularly because of what happened over the last year and a half. Parents are staying at home because they were told to stay home and do their work at home. And so were the students. And now the students are saying, why do I need to go back to school? I can do everything from here. And quite honestly, some of them have gone on and they've actually started businesses out of their house. I read a, a, an article not, not too many days ago about a, a young gentleman who actually started reselling uh, uh, PlayStations in whatever manner. He'd bulk them up, he'd buy them up, and he bought a warehouse, rented a warehouse, and he was going to school in the morning and they'd work his business in the afternoon. Last year, that gentleman cleared $3 million in gross sales 
had hired three of his buddies to work the warehouse, and his net profit after everybody was paid, rent was paid, his net profit was $110,000. And this is from a freshman in college. Because he had time on his hands to do something besides earn a degree. Why would you want to go back to college if you could provide yourself with those opportunities rather than sit through stiff, dull, 20th century way of learning in a theater you know, setting classroom? For some, it's experiential. I get that. But if that's the only way that students are allowed to learn, or the great majority, then we are doing a disservice to where this state needs to go in the next 50 years. Because I tell you what, if you thought that technology was going to change the way that learning was accomplished even 10 years ago to now, you have no idea based upon the futurists that I have listened to with people in the know that are nodding in agreement even another 10 years from now what our higher educational systems will need to look like to compete globally. Amen. When you take a look at what's happening in China, when you, ha when you see what's happening in Russia, when you see what's happening in, in Europe, we are behind the eight ball when it comes to global competitiveness for intellectual talent. And if we do train them, by and large, some of them just go home. We have to keep them here. Amen. Give them opportunities to stay here. And we know that if they stay here for at least a couple years, they stay for a long time because they put down roots, they want to contribute in their, their communities, their kids are going to school here, and they are contributing members of the state and the city that they live in. This is a large task, and it deserves our fullest attention. This does not represent the best effort of either chamber in putting together a conference committee report, a report that would assist in any number of these areas. It wouldn't take that long to put some better ideas into this body of work. But we've been locked out. We've been locked out because the tribunal has made a determination of what's going to be the final deal. When I go back into my district and I explain to them, eh, it's, that's the way it is. First question they ask is, why did we elect you? Why are you even going to St. Paul? And members, I can't disagree. Three individuals have relegated us to Zoom calls and sitting in a chamber that is devoid of the opportunity to participate in how this budget is crafted. We should be ashamed. But we're going along with it, except at least on, not on this side of the aisle because it means that much that we stand up for the voices of our constituents and make their voices heard in the decision-making that's been going on. I was at coffee not too long ago with one of my constituents, and he was very frustrated. And he said, he's a former military guy, and he said, this sounds like and he coined the phrase, Operation Secret Session. 
are we really participating in Operation Secret Session, where we basically just watch things go and we push a button and it goes on? I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for the opportunity to have a robust debate, whether it be in conference committee, in committee, or on this floor, rather than just say, push a button, let's move it on, let's get out of here by June 30th because we don't want to shut down the state. Well, sad to say, it's important that we get this right because it's their money that's funding these programs. We need to be good stewards. And that starts with making sure that the provisions in these bills are appropriate, needful, and effective. And with that, members, I encourage you to vote green on the re-referral to higher ed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right, next on the list, we got Representative Daniels. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just wanted to thank my colleagues for putting on a good uh, debate here tonight and the reason to have to re-refer uh, this bill back to committee. There are so many issues on it, so many problems, and it's a huge budget. You were talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, uh, so I just want to thank Representative Albright, Representative Erickson, Representative uh, Mickland and my, my sister, Representative O'Neill, a lot of good points brought up. Um, some of them kind of scare me uh, when the Representative O'Neill was speaking about the grants. Uh, they can, they, instead of having to transfer back to the general fund if they're not all spent, they can be transferred to back and forth. Um, it, my knowledge in higher ed, that's never, that's never been uh, possible before. Um, so a lot of good points made. I won't try to repeat them if I, if I can. Um, so I thought I'd start with just my kind of background. Um, when I was in high school, my uh, family owned a Suzuki Polaris dealership. And uh, my older two brothers had already gone on to college. Uh, my, my older brother uh, went to Detroit Lakes Tech and ended up going there for six months. Um, was actually teaching or helping the, the uh, uh, teacher there teach the course after about uh, two months. So he graduated with a two-year degree in, in, in six months. And um, he actually would, took over our, our family Suzuki Polaris shop and ran that for three years and then uh, found out that uh, Suzuki wanted to hire him for a uh, a national teacher, national trainer for uh, Suzuki product. So they moved him out to Chicago, and uh, he taught there for about eight years. And then he had an opportunity to go to Marvin Windows. Now, this is a person that has six months of tech college under his belt, and now he's uh, flying a private jet from Chicago to World to be interviewed for a, a new department for Mar Marvin Windows uh, for um, research and development. And um, he's very successful. He's in his 39th year at Marvin Windows, an yeah, extremely brilliant man. Um, and uh, I keep going back, it's six months of technology at Detroit Lakes, and he got uh, very, very well in life. Uh, um, after doing that, and I've got other, my, my four adult children all went to college. Three of them went to four-year degrees. One of them went to a two-year tech degree. Um, they're all successful in their own way. Couldn't be more proud of them. Um, and there's always a different path. You can choose your path. Uh, Representative Albright kind of mentioned that a little bit, but we all have our choices we can make. And uh, my oldest uh, daughter, she decided to go to Mankato State, did a four-year degree there, got a, got a degree in uh, communications, uh, ended up moving down to Destin, Florida, uh, met her future husband down there, and they've been there for 15 years now. Uh, my oldest son chose to go to Wilmer Technical College and they get, get a degree in welding. Um, 
He's now at uh, Foldcraft and Canyon. Uh, he's also deaf, which is uh, somewhat of a disability. I don't call it a disability. I call you're not disabled, you're just able in a different way. Uh, I'm really proud of him. He is now supervisor of about eight or nine people uh, at Foldcraft Manufacturing Plant. They build like furniture for like Subway and custom made furniture. They uh, had in Burnsville, one of their shops, they were making the these huge 33-foot long stainless steel benches for the Target Center when it was being built. Um, but he's done extremely well. Uh, my middle son um, decided to go to Iowa State and get an engineering degree. So, um, you know, another four-year degree. My youngest son went to Stout for four years and uh, into the studio arts uh, trade. Uh, that one didn't pan out so good when he graduated. He but he didn't have a, a career to go to. So uh, he's had to work really hard. He's done a really good job. He's been uh, promoted a number of times at the different jobs he's had, but so proud of my kids. They've done so well, uh, but they all had different paths. And it wasn't like one path is the same for, for everybody is the right path for everybody. Um, we talked about HEPR, uh, the maintenance funds. Um, I actually drafted a bill last year to see if we can get a handle on that. Instead of coming to the legislature every couple of years for a couple hundred million dollars to try to fix the buildings, uh, that we could maybe do a, a combination of uh, some state funding to catch up on the HEPR money and then making sure that the state colleges and the University of Minnesota put their own dollars into it. So they got some skin in the game. So that, uh, that bill is... a. Uh, Pretty much ready to go to um, to be be jacketed. Um, we talked about uh, mental health. Uh, my sister, Representative O'Neill, talked about mental health and lack of funding. We have actually no funding in this uh, bill for mental health. And uh, when uh, Representative Albright was talking about MICC, um, I had a couple little things kind of jotted down. Um, and mental health is, is so important. And if, you're, if you have like a autism, which these kids do, they go to MICC, they are literally living in their mom and dad's basement. Um, there was uh, some information I got from one of the gals at MICC. 87% um, continue to live with their parents after high school. Only one third of the individuals with autism have any kind of post-secondary education. Less than half uh, held any kind of a paid employment within four years of graduating high school. 24%, um, this is one that caught me, 24% are socially isolated, meaning they have no contact with anyone outside of their family for over a year. And that's, of course, during the pandemic. Uh, we talk about mental health problems, and you couldn't ask for a worst case scenario than having somebody living in their mom and dad's basement and not having any interaction with any other uh, friends or family members. And I'll tell you, just to touch on MICC a little bit, they have such a successful program. Um, I was at two of their graduations, and uh, at that time they were graduating about 15 people per year. And uh, the kids, when they gave their little speeches uh, during the uh, graduation ceremony, they were cracking jokes. They were, you know, making fun of other people. I mean, they were just having a really good time. And uh, I thought, this is really nice. This is really good. And then uh, during the uh, graduation ceremony, they acknowledged uh, me and, at that time, Representative Christensen for providing the funding. We were at the two at the graduation. So uh, when the uh, event got done, um, I saw somebody out on my sideline here, on my peripheral, going very quickly through the tables to get to talk to me. Now, I'm an old-time motocross racer. When you see something out of your peripheral and it's coming at you, you kind of get ready for what's ever coming. And I thought, do I duck? Do I cover? What's going on? So anyway, this gentleman gets up right to us, thanks Representative Christensen and myself for the funding, and he says, I'm moving my son out of my basement today, and he does the fist bump. 
and he is excited. He's going to have his son be able to live pretty much a normal life instead of living in his mom and dad's basement. So um, that, that, that college is tremendous things. They use a three-year program. Uh, they actually teach the kids how to grocery shop, how to fill out a checkbook, how to cook a meal. Um, they tell, teach them about a culinary craft or a housekeeping craft. Anything that they're interested in, they'll teach them the skills so they can get employed. Then I found out once they get employed, they start shopping around for an apartment. And after a number of years of graduations, you got quite a few kids out there. I found out just a couple of years ago that uh, these kids not only are happy and successful in what they're doing in their job and living independently, but they are now getting apartments either in the same building or close to the same building. So on Friday nights, they have a party night. So these kids, starting in their mom and dad's basement, three years at MICC, learn how to life skills, learn a, a trade that they can actually make a living on, and now they're socializing on Friday nights. So just to give you an idea what the success is for MICC, and I did talk to the Cali over there, and uh, if we can get them more money, their programs are scalable. Uh, they're doing 15 to 25 students per year right now, but they could do more. Um, and considering that only uh, one-third of the individuals any, have any post-secondary education, you know, we have a lot of potential there. And we talk about job shortages, where there's help-wanted signs everywhere. A lot of these kids can do those jobs and be very happy, very successful at it. So just a little, uh, a little information to MICC. Uh, one thing, I, th I can't remember if it was Representative uh, Meckland or who it was, we were talking about um, fees and um, for the colleges. And uh, one of our LAs, it's right outside of my door, actually had uh, told me about what his experience was. And I didn't know this before yesterday, but evidently, if you're in the University of Minnesota and you're going to college, if you can't prove that you have your own insurance, they will charge you, and this student got charged $1,384 for the semester for health insurance. $1,384 tacked on to a $6,000 tuition, and you know, that's what, 20% added on to your cost of going to college? And if that wasn't insulting enough, then he says, we couldn't, we were told we can't go to our classes. We have to do it on Zoom. We have to do it that way. There is another $81 charge to have your classes on Zoom rather than in the classroom itself. So I'm a little perplexed as why in the world we have to charge more to have it on Zoom than taking care of a classroom. Um, so that was kind of a, a shock to me. Um, some of my uh, constituents, we're talking about colleges, both the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota State. Uh, sometimes there's a disconnect from what classes they're taking to uh, what they really want to do in life. That's why we always talk about it's so nice to start with a two-year um, degree and then you can find out if you really want to get into something specific. Um, my youngest son is a good example. He went to almost five years um, at Stout and graduated with a degree that he can't find a job in. So it's a little frustrating as a parent who's put tens of thousands of dollars into that education uh, to see him having to work at you know Menards and uh, um, Cabela's. Um, so I, I, I have a little grudge to, to hold there um, as far as for colleges not preparing these students uh, for a career. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my little college in, uh, in Faribault, Faribault and North Mankato, South Central College. Um, I'm in uh, close contact with our president there. She's an amazing woman. Uh, Dr. Annette Parker 
has done a great job. She's only been there, I think it's six years, maybe seven years. And when all the other colleges' enrollments were going down like three, four, five, six percent per year, hers were going up four or five percent per year. So that was nice to see. And they offer so many services. If they don't have the particular a specific class that a student wants to take, they'll contract with somebody else to teach that class for them. So in other words, the, the student doesn't have to go searching all over the country, try to find the class. They'll set up the class with them. And uh, last year I found out, uh, got together with my uh, president there, and she said, we were just in this, I can't remember the name of the magazine. I'm sorry, Dr. Parker, I forgot. But um, they were voted the 14th best technical college in the country. And there's a lot of technical college, colleges in the country. And I was really um, glad that they won that because they do really look out for the student. The student is number one in their, well, like in so many varieties of, of classes, but I'll mention the welding class. Um, they have a two year program. Almost never does somebody go to school at South Central College for welding and finish the two-year program. They get hired by a business shortly after the first year. You know, they may have less than a semester into their second year, and they're already working. They're hired by a company, and they're making they're making good money. These guys are starting at you know twenty-one dollars minimum, uh, full benefits. I mean, it's just it's changed so much. I was a welder back in my teenage days and uh, the, the equipment that they use and the, the filters and the systems to keep you uh, uh, out of the smoke has been just, you know, night and day. The, the brightness of the shops, you know, it's just amazing from, from what it used to be 30, 40 years ago. Um, I know one of, uh, I think it was Representative Albright touched on safety. And uh, that's got to be our number one concern. When our, no matter where they go, my middle son went to Iowa State. My young son went to uh, Stout in Wisconsin. No matter where they're at, you want to know that they're safe. And I tell you what, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul this last year, uh, you know, crime is skyrocketing. And we have no help from the uh, cities to add their police to add to their police departments. They are, I just uh, read a, a deal on the news, they were, uh, Minneapolis was at 600 police officers and they should be at 1,200 police officers. And uh, before we left last night, we heard there were gunshots on Rice Street, right across, right on our street from the SOB. So um, we've got to get control of that. We've got to get our, uh, know that our kids can go to college and go to, you know, different uh, functions and back to the theaters and back to whatever they want to do. But man, we've got we've got to pick up the pace on on safety. Um, let's see, what other direction did I have here? I think I covered all the things on the choice. I just want to fill in the the paths. Everybody's got their own choice to make. Everybody's got their own path. And again, I believe it was uh, Representative Albright who mentioned, if somebody goes to college and goes to four years and charges up $100,000 in student loans, why is that our responsibility to, to, to bail them out? And uh, I know in my family that's never happened, it's not gonna happen. Um, I, just, I just can't see that. So I would uh, stress that we need to get a handle on the cost of college. Um, I mentioned a few things where the uh, insurance and the uh, online fees, but there's tons of fees in this uh, form that this uh, LA gave me. Uh, everything from the, the gopher transportation to uh, student access fees to uh, um, service fees, you know, and his tuition started out about $1,600. And uh, this one here is, up to about $4,000 with all the different fees in there. Um, so anyway, I just, uh, all these problems we have with this bill, not having control over the, the grants, um, not really fixing any of the problems that are in there. 
the massive funding we have. Uh, there's kind of some in inequities from the University of Minnesota to the state programs. State colleges uh, serve over 400,000 students, and I believe the University of Minnesota is uh, around 60,000. So there's some things we need to work out. And then we ought to talk about the federal funding coming in, make sure we have some controls on that and where that's going to go and how that's going to be spent. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, I just uh, want to reiterate that uh, this needs to go back to, this bill needs to go back to uh, committee so it can be properly vetted. Um, we can maybe put, get some of these problems fixed and bring it back, and maybe we can all come to a unanimous uh, agreement on it. So that's my, my request, is to bring it back to the conference or the uh, higher ed committee and uh, let us uh, rework it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, next on the list, uh, the representative from Crow Wing, Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too would rise and speak in favor of referring this, this bill back to the Higher Ed Committee. Um, you know, it's getting late, it's after 10 o'clock. Yeah, it is. Right. But Republicans are here tonight because we believe in the process. It'd be very easy to uh, go back to our offices and call it a day and uh, just move on. This special session has provided an opportunity, though. It's an opportunity to see where people stand on how this institution should be run how bills and legislation should come together, and maybe how it shouldn't. Representative Lucero has been great at pointing out one, one, and one, right? Three people shouldn't be deciding for the entire legislature. It doesn't matter if it's a commerce bill, the egg bill, the higher education bill, That isn't how this place is supposed to work. Now, I've only been here seven years. This is my fourth term. You know, and I've seen, I've seen some years when things went really, really well. The process was right there for the public to interact. The committee structure was in place for them to come to share their thoughts and concerns, advocate for bills and legislation that they felt would improve the the institutions that they represented or the organizations that they wanted to support and advocate for. This last year, clearly a worldwide pandemic had an impact, but guess what? The state of Minnesota is behind. More specifically, the Minnesota House of Representatives was behind. While the Senate was, uh, was finding a hybrid that worked to allow that process to continue to function here in the Minnesota House of Representatives, fully remote. If you're in greater Minnesota and you don't have a high-speed internet connection, guess what? You're basically locked out of this year's process. Representative Igo, your constituents, my constituents, and Representative Lewick, Aiken County, we could have a long conversation about broadband and the need for high-speed internet in rural Minnesota, but we're here talking about the higher education bill. Yeah, you're right, Representative Lego. <laughs> There's not a lot of folks over there. But our constituents uh, had a heck of a time trying to interact over the course of the last six months trying to participate. And students who are here for right now, advocating for, boy, they had an even worse time. Representative Daniels, I'm shocked that on top of uh, the hardship that our students faced in being remote and having to try to access classes, they were on to add insult to injury, they were charged more 
in some cases. That's something that this committee needs to look at. This bill should be going back to the higher ed committee because the process should still matter. I'm a proud father of six, ranging in age from 20 now all the way down to five, Troy's five. You've seen him bouncing around the chamber every once in a while the last few days. Goes and finds Uncle Kurt wherever he can, finds some skills or something in Representative O'Driscoll's desk. And uh, my three oldest are either graduated from a state program or currently enrolled in fall semester. My family is heavily invested and personally has benefited in our uh, public institutions, specifically Men's State, as I just mentioned. And uh, Chair Bernardi is not on the floor right now, but I want to personally thank Chair Bernardi. I think that uh, I think that her committee ran better than, than many of the committees. I heard a few stories here and there, and Chair Bernardi we tried very hard. Sorry, Chair Hansen. Great committee. <laughs> You're here. I should have at least mentioned your committee. <laughs> uh, but there's still some things that I think clearly we're willing to stand and, and to advocate that this, this bill has an opportunity to enjoy the process as it was meant to be. We'd like our constituents to have the opportunity to participate in that process, go into a committee room, as I mentioned earlier, and share their thoughts. Representative Sandell, your constituents, a lot of high-speed internet access in your district. Not that way around the state. So, of course, Mid-State has a significant impact as I'm referring repetitively to greater Minnesota, but a significant impact across the entire state. We love the University of Minnesota, and we're not trying to take anything away in, this, in our comments, or at least I'm not trying to in my comments. But uh, 37 campuses Men's State operates. Serves over 400,000 students, as many as 450,000. I'm a proud Men's State graduate, PSEO student, started classes in 1995. That was when you were in quarter credits, so they no longer have that. And what a phenomenal opportunity. We talk often about how we are needing and we're, in, we're, we're seeing we have to do something about student debt. And it's astonishing to me that more kids don't choose either CIS programs, college in the schools, or PSEO as an option. Incredible that you can earn your AA and your high school degree at the exact same time. You know what, in the state of Minnesota, that is, uh, that is a option that was groundbreaking, started here in Minnesota really propelled hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kids into an early start, either to launch into another degree beyond a Men's State program. Of course, it was Men's SKU then. Transfer those credits, get those generals done, and then move on. Or like in my case, get the tools that I needed to be successful at our family business. the skills that I needed to be able to repair equipment as a welder, electronics so that I could understand the systems that our, our company used on a frequent basis. And then maybe when it came time for book work, a little accounting class, 
Thank you, Jeff Wig. Some great teachers that I was blessed to uh, be able to study under. Tom Reese. Might as well shout out a few names if you have the opportunity. We even had the legendary mad hugger, Joe Plutt. Central Lakes College campus. <laughs> yeah, so many great people in men's state programs and at campuses around the state of Minnesota. Not just mine, I'm sure, but that's my experience. Great people. It's kind of funny, this last week, the, uh, the actual brick and mortar structure that was Central Lakes College in here, uh, in Crow and County, was torn down. They have a new building. It was built years ago, I guess, already. But the original building was torn down just this week. But so many students are benefiting from these programs. And uh, PSEO and, and, like I said, college in the schools, giving kids a, a head start. In my first term, 2015 was the first session that I got to enjoy here at the Capitol, and new to uh, everything happening here. I didn't know how good it was, considering what we've experienced this last session, but being able to serve on the higher ed committee then and then work on a number of really interesting and at that time somewhat groundbreaking uh, ideas. I got to carry the open source textbook bill. Now it's a completely normal thing. You have... Uh, Professors from all over the country collaborating to uh, create textbooks. In many cases, those textbooks are available online at no cost to students or minimal cost access. Worked on solving some of the problems with credit transfer between campuses, institutions around the state. What a great opportunity uh, to see firsthand what can happen here when legislators work together, get the work done, roll up their sleeves, bipartisan in that effort, and uh, see legislation make its way through divided legislature, or maybe in that case, uh, yeah, 2015, that would have been a divided legislature, I think. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my recollection. So, you know, it's just really incredible. Here we are tonight fighting for that process. Republicans want to see these bills done right. And I know that some Democrats, my friends on the other side of the aisle, thank you, Steve, for being a good friend. Uh, There's, there's differences of opinion, what, what we should do going forward through this special session, but we really believe that these bills need a second opportunity to go back to committee and uh, have that process work. I think it's really a precious thing. Now, I look forward to maybe having the opportunity to be a part of making sure that process does work and maybe a future legislature in a way that I think that uh, historically has, has worked the tradition and the uh, uh, in the processes that we have here, the rules. You know, but I don't think that's happened this year, and I've already gone through that a little bit, but each of us in our own way trying to figure out what is, what is the very best path, the very best solutions to problems that uh, our institutions are facing. You know, and I hope that we are able to come together this session. I hope this special session ends with a win for Minnesotans, not for a party. For kids. That's what we're here for, right? You know, so regardless of how the next few hours or next few days turn out, I really hope that that, that is the end result. That whether it's my kids or your kids that benefit from our work here this coming day or in the next few days, 
that transparency and accountability are there throughout each step here at the Minnesota Capitol and in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Um, I think uh, Representative Daniels was mentioning a few of his kids and the experience that they had and the success story that each one in their own way benefited. And many of you have known my kids. Ken is, is my oldest. I mentioned him earlier. And uh, how Men's State was able to provide the tools he needed to launch into a career at telecom in Alaska right now. And uh, we all like to brag on our kids here. That's, that's part of the family, the legislative family that you have here at the Capitol. And I think that there's those stories playing out all over the, all over the country, really, but here in Minnesota especially. Each, uh, each person with different gifts and abilities, some meant for a four-year school, like you were saying, Representative Daniel, some benefiting, like myself, from a two-year program and going right to work, making a life for ourselves with the help of uh, a great program that fit what our needs might happen to be. You know, and we might see changes come. In the Brainerd Lakes area, we saw a paper mill close a couple of decades ago. And folks were able to immediately transition into a new uh, training and get re-educated as electricians or plumbers or driving truck. You know, each of these great institutions, the University of Minnesota and, and, uh, and Central Lake College in my, own, in my own city, working towards that goal of getting kids what they need to be successful, and in some case, in some cases, uh, folks that are leaving one career and transitioning into another. Uh, a, a great program in the trades can help them make that adjustment and get back into uh, a career that's working for their families, high-paying jobs all over the state. So, you know, that's just my two cents on this issue and, and some of the reasons that I really believe that we need to change, need to change course. You know, and hopefully that can happen even in the dark of night. And we can make that change, get this uh, process back on track. You know, before I yield the mic back, I'm going to uh, give a shout out to another great professor at Central Lakes College, someone that I think that would appreciate it, and that's uh, former state representative Steve Wenzel, professor of political science. A lot of you know him. Uh, so, you know, that's a career change in case someone is ever thinking about leaving the legislature, that might be an option. I know my kids have certainly been uh, blessed to participate in his coursework. And we're also proud of our campuses, you know, in our hometowns. Now, nothing's perfect, but there's some great stuff happening at one of these 37 campuses all over the state and at the University of Minnesota. You know, so I think I'm going to wrap it up with that. And uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts on this bill. And I hope that uh, members would vote to refer this, this bill back to committee. Thank you. All right. The representative from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, I did not serve on the higher ed committee this past uh, uh, session. I have served uh, in two previous bienniums. In fact, I think I've served with uh, Chair Bernardi on higher ed in the past. And uh, the chairman's, one time it was uh, Chairman Bud Nornis. Some of you remember him. He did an excellent job. And then we also had Chairman uh, Pulowski, who I really grew to like and respect. 
and uh, his knowledge and background in uh, higher ed and education in general. Uh, maybe he's listening. I don't like to compliment him too much. He might get a big head. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, you know, members, there are, I think, student debt, and I would uh, assume that Chair Bernardi would agree with this and also all members, is just becoming a crisis. You know, it's been a few years since I've been on the higher ed, and maybe Chair Bernardi remembers this also, but we had a young lady testify about student debt at the higher ed committee that I remember. And she seemed like a very nice young lady. She had been studying to become a veterinarian. But she shared that her total student debt was $400,000. And she was, <laughs> I think she was in her mid-20s. Members, $400,000. She also shared, based on my memory, that she expected to graduate in about a year, and she expected to start at a salary at about $70,000. Now, memory, members, you take room, board, taxes, and a few other things out of the $70,000, and you're looking at $400,000 of debt. I mean, this is an albatross on these young people, okay? And she seemed committed to uh, completing her education. But when she shared those figures, I have to admit, I got a pit in my stomach for her. I just thought 400,000, then you had interest on that, members. I mean, it just, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at, we're in a crisis of student debt. I know nationally, I think in Someone can correct me, but I know it's well over a trillion dollars of student debt. And yet many of these students graduating aren't able to find work or have a fulfilling career. And I think it's a contributing factor to some of the uh, dismay we see in our society of uh, college graduates that have been educated in an area that does not give them much of a future or very limited chance of a future. Uh, now I have to give credit to my next concern uh, to rep former Representative Bob Barrett. Some of you maybe remember him. Uh, he created an interest in this area for me. And I know Represent Chairman Bernardi was here on the floor. Uh, where is the young lady when I need her? No. <laughs> but I wanted to ask her a couple of questions. Maybe she'll come back. But members, one of the things to get uh, student debt under control is comparative and historical analysis to other like colleges and universities. Now, the University of Minnesota happens to be in a conference, and I just did a quick a review here on the internet of about 13 schools. It used to be the Big Ten. Now it's up, I think, to 13 schools. Now I did a, an analysis, a quick analysis of the tuition charge of the 13 schools in their conference. You know, members, when I was on, uh, when I was chief negotiator with certified staff, when I was on the school board, I'll let you repeat that. Uh, uh, one of the things we, uh, the, that was constantly brought up was conference averages, the comparative salaries and benefits to the rest of the conference uh, that our school was a part of. Well, that's basically what I'm trying to do here with the colleges. Now, when former Representative Bob Barrett was uh, on the Higher Ed Committee, he showed that out of, and I think there were only 10 or 11, there were 10 or 11 schools in the conference at that time. Based on my research here, it's up to 13. Bob showed that we were one of the bottom in terms of student tuition in the conference on charging foreign and out-of-state students, members. We were on the, one of the bottom of charging tuition to foreign and out-of-state students at the University of Minnesota. 
In contrast, at that particular time when Bob, uh, Bob Barrett did his analysis, uh, student tuition for in-state students was one of the highest in the conference. So we were charging one of the lowest tuition charge for students outstate and foreign students. And by the way, it also was brought up that many foreign students pay cash for their tuition, okay? Uh, because the wealthier uh, uh, individuals from foreign countries were able to pay cash uh, for the tuition versus borrowing the money and creating debt for the student. So there was an inverse relationship that caused a lot of consternation. And it was one of the things uh, uh, former Representative Bob Barrett and myself tried to address. Now, members, I did a quick analysis of that and uh, uh, of the 13 schools, and you can do your analysis on the internet also. But what I found is that in-state tuition a comparative, okay? Remember, that's the only way you really know what's going on in terms of cost, comparative and historical. Um, two schools, charged higher tuition in, out of 13 schools than the University of Minnesota. The university in two schools out of the 13 charged about the same. So the University of Minnesota and two other uh, colleges and university charged about the same. But eight schools out of 13 charged a lower yearly tuition members than the University of Minnesota, okay? So again, we're, we tend to be higher on that. There's been a little bit of improvement compared to when I was on the higher ed committee, but we're still in the top area out of 13 schools in terms of charging in-state students. And by the way, one of the reasons this is important is because who pays the taxes in, much of the taxes, to support the University of Minnesota? It's Minnesota taxpayers. And yet their students are being charged one of the higher tuitions in the 13 schools. Now when we compare that to out of state and foreign students, and again I did a quick analysis, you can do your own. Seven of the 13 colleges and universities in the conference charge a higher tuition than the University of Minnesota for out-of-state and foreign students. And keep in mind, a lot of those foreign students can pay cash for their tuition. The university and one other school in the conference charge about the same, and uh, four, uh, co four colleges and university charge less. So we've moved up from the bottom of what we charge foreign and out-of-state students, somewhat, but we're still in the bottom half. Now, why is this important, members? Because this affects the tuition. And I think if we're going to scale the uh, tuition at the university, it should favor in-state students versus out-of-state and foreign students. Remember, it's Minnesota taxpayers that are primarily subsidizing the University of Minnesota. So Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I know, <laughs> uh, would Chair Bernardi uh, yield for a question? She will not, uh, Representative Grunhagen. She will not. Uh, Mr. Speaker, would she yield for a uh, possible question? <laughs> Asked and answered. Pardon? She will not. Okay. Well, Chair Bernardi, you know I got along pretty good with you, I think, when I was on the committee, but be that as it may. Uh, is uh, Representative O'Neill on the floor? She's always a blessing. <laughs> she will yield. Representative Grunhagen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair O'Neill, or I mean, 
maybe soon to be Chair O'Neill. Um, <laughs> slip of the mind there. Uh, you notice I don't say Freudian because I don't believe in him. He's a sexual pervert, by the way. Uh, what, <laughs> just a side note. Um, uh, Representative O'Neill, was this discussed in committee and an analysis done on these types of t statistics within the conference, and was it addressed in any way? I did not see it in the bill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. No, we didn't discuss that. We, we really discussed, you're talking about the University of Minnesota and the analysis that former Representative Bob Barrett had done. And, you know, it was, it was interesting you talk about former Representative Bob Barrett because I served with him in the higher ed committee the year that you're talking about. And he sat right next to me on the House floor. You know what the two of us did? Is that we ran through spreadsheets and he... There was only one other representative that loved spreadsheets more than Representative Bob Barrett, and that was Representative Vogel. So, uh, so yes, I mean, we talked about that uh, in that year, in 2015. We did not discuss that this year. We didn't look through spreadsheets like that. We didn't have that kind of conversation with the University of Minnesota. It was very high level. Uh, I do remember we had a lot of students, one after another, after another, come in and talk about their experience, things like that. Um, we had very little, honestly, conversation about the University of Minnesota. We talked very little about some of their specials, so all the different research projects that they do, the Min Drive, the uh, the regenerative medicine, we, we had very little conversation about that. Um, so, no, we really didn't get into uh, tuition. We didn't get into the whole conversation about administrative expenses. Uh, some of these things that I remember in 2015, we spent a lot of time talking about those things. And, and uh, sometimes I felt like I was at the tip of the spear asking those questions. And if I didn't ask them, Representative Barrett did. And so... Um, but the, the good thing is that conversation we had back in 2015 did spur some changes at the U. And so they began to look at out-of-state tuition and in-state tuition, and they began to put some balance there. So, and that is a conversation that I have had personally with some of the regents. So there are several regents that uh, had concern about transparency, about tuition rates for their students, about the administrative costs all those sorts of things. Um, and so while those conversations have happened, they really didn't happen much in the committee. And, and I am disappointed with that. And I suppose if Representative Barrett was, was still here, he would pull out his spreadsheets and his analysis and, you know, and ask all of those hard questions. But, but be, you know, you, you can be a little bit happy about the fact that his work from 2015 has carried forward. And, um, I remember in that year, I think you mentioned the ranking of how expensive in-state tuition is for our students at the University of Minnesota, and that has come into a little bit better balance. I know it's not, it's not fantastic, it's not the best in the nation or anything, but it's, it's a little bit more balanced compared to out-state. So we had those conversations, you know, and, and honestly, Representative Grunhagen, there's a lot of things I wish we had had conversations about. Um, Back in 2015, we passed the bill to do universal policy across all of the institutions of higher education about sexual assault. And so I was really hoping to hear sort of the results of that work. And, uh, oh, he never really, the Office of Higher Education never really brought it up as to, well, you know, how is that working? And they're supposed to do trainings at every single institution of higher learning if they have 100 or more students. And that never came up either. Um, another piece of legislation I worked on back then was dual training grants. So that is a really successful program. It was uh, former Senator Bonoff and I that worked on that. And we didn't talk about that either. There's just, you know, which is kind of what I alluded to in my uh, beginning of this conversation is that there's so much in this bill. Uh, some prior work that we didn't get reports on, some decisions that were made in this bill that we didn't talk about. So yeah, these are all things that we should be discussing, you know, because they are still in here. So there's dual training is still in here. Um, we haven't addressed anything in here about the administrative costs for the University of Minnesota. There is nothing addressed in here with that. So that's a disappointment. There's a lot of things that we could have done and should have done. 
um, and we still could do, quite honestly, which is what this motion is all about, that quite frankly hasn't been done yet. But you know, just to bolster your conversation about the re-referral, that is exactly why we need the re-referral, because we really need to dig in and, and talk about that. And you know, specifically about the U, they had an ask of $46.5 million, and they said that's the bare minimum of what they need to get by. They had used up their reserves, they had done pay cuts, they had done cuts, administrative costs. Now, they didn't give me a spreadsheet so I could see it, Representative Bernhagen, but they were telling us all these things. And they said 46 and a half million is the bear of what they needed. Well, in this bill, it's 38 and a half. So I'm not sure what they're going to do with you know, the difference. I don't know what they're going to do to compensate for the difference. We, don't, we haven't had the opportunity to hear that. Are they going to do further cuts? Are they going to go and do some big fundraiser? I, I don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to try to use some of their business income and, and that sort of thing to compensate? We have no idea. Are they going to sacrifice security on the campuses? My goodness, I mean, think about the students right now as they're returning to campus, Representative Grunhagen. Those poor students are just in fear for their lives, and I'm not exaggerating. There is so much crime, particularly on the Twin Cities campus of the University of Minnesota and the surrounding area. They are absolutely terrified. So who knows, maybe they're going to have to cut the police force. So, you know, they have their own police force, the police force at the University of Minnesota. There are some really, really difficult decisions that are going to be needing to be made because of this bill. And what are the repercussions? I have no idea. I have no idea how they're going to come up with the difference between the $46.5 million and the $38 million that we're giving them. I don't know. I certainly hope they don't sacrifice the safety of their students, but they're going to have to cut somewhere, do something different. But there's all kinds of questions that need to be answered, which is why we need to refer this back to committee. Because you know what? The University of Minnesota can't come on this floor and they can't pick up a microphone and they can't speak to us. Even if they were up in the balcony right now, they can't. It would be completely out of order for them to answer our questions. These questions must be answered in committee. That's the only place that we can answer these questions. Unless they want to call me up on my cell phone right now, which I doubt would happen. But still, it's not public. Representative Grunhagen, you and I both care so much about public transparency. That's why we're having these conversations here tonight, and that's why it's so important to send this back to committee. So they can come before the committee, we can ask them the hard questions. I wish you were still on the committee because you asked some really good questions and have really great insight. So that would be... It would be wonderful to have them come back, explain exactly what they're going to do with the, the drop in the appropriations that we're going to give them, and really have these deep conversations about tuition, about administrative costs, about safety and security on their college campuses. These are all really important things that are the mental health. I talked about that earlier. You know, do they have enough counselors on site? Do they have support for these students as they're returning back to campus? All of these things are things that we did not discuss when the bill was completed because, quite frankly, they didn't know what they were going to get. And the last word I heard from them is they needed $46.5 million. That's what I heard. In fact, Regent Svigum even called me personally, I think, five times <laughs> to tell me we really need $46.5 million. We're not kidding. Well, they're not getting that. So I don't know what they're going to do. So, Representative Grunhagen, I really wish I had the answers for you, but we didn't have the committee hearing, we didn't discuss that, and we don't have Representative uh, uh, Barrett in the committee anymore to bring up all of these things and to do all the data analysis like he, like he did. He was really great at that. So, we're kind of, we're missing that. And uh, I appreciate the question. Thank you so much, Representative Grunhagen. Representative thank Grunhagen. Oh, well, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Yeah, I miss Bob Barrett, too. He was a fiscal analyst. And that's one of the reasons he did excellent uh, spreadsheets. And he did one on the Met Council, too, which I really appreciated. <laughs> but anyway, back to tuition. Members, I think all of us realize that this tuition increases and the cost cannot keep going. It's not sustainable, members. Okay? We have to address it. And one of the best ways to address it is historical and and, and comparable uh, to other schools of, of like 
uh, in the same conference. Members, um, the, uh, I did one other quick analysis uh, that, could, that should be done. I took the in-state versus out-of-state and foreign, and I multiplied the in-state, or div divided the in-state by the out-state, and for instance, in Michigan State, 36% in-state students are paying 36% tuition of what out-state and foreign students are. At the University of Minnesota, they're paying 45% members. So again, we're, it seems like we're tilting the scale towards out-of-state and foreign students to the disadvantage of Minnesota students. And when Minnesota taxpayers are picking up the bill, I think that's wrong. And that should be addressed in this legislation. Um, the other thing that was brought up is that, um, you know, the security. I, I happened to notice there was an amendment coming up by Representative Scott, if she's available. Oh, she is available, yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, if she'd yield for a question. She will yield, Representative yeah, Grunhagen. Representative Scott, you've done uh, yeoman's work on security, uh, you know, uh, personal privacy, and a whole host of other areas since I've been here. I have a lot of respect for your knowledge and understanding of that. And I notice you have an amendment to move a million dollars from the direct ad admissions of Minnesota to the campus safety, security, and improvements of the University of Minnesota. What was your motivation for doing that uh, in terms of uh, shifting that money to security? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. My motivation was that we need to make sure our college campuses are safe places. And if you look at the crime, even in and around the campus, it's, it's not good. And this has been during a period of time, if you look at just last year's data, you know, there weren't a lot of students on campus. And so um, I, I think that uh, the number of victims is probably actually gonna go up once the kids get back on campus. And, and so this is just to make, uh, to put some add some security improvements a lot around the campus, um, whether it's additional cameras or um, the emergency call phones, those sorts of things, um, maybe additional lighting um, to better protect people. So uh, my motivation was just purely just to make sure that a college campus is a safer place. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Representative Scott. Yeah, I think members, uh, both sides of the aisle want our colleges and universities to be safe. And we know that with the demonization of uh, law enforcement in uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, that we've seen a skyrocketing uh, crime, serious crime. Uh, we just had was mentioned by uh, Representative uh, O'Neill's uh, brother, Daniel, Daniel yeah. <laughs> I knew I'd get it right sooner or later. <laughs> you know, everybody has weaknesses, minus names, okay? Um, he uh, brought up the fact uh, of the safety also, along with uh, Representative Albright. And members, I think part of the reason this needs to go back, we really need to vet the safety feature for our students. Think of it, members. You know, you're talking about 18, seven, or 18, 19, 20-year-old uh, young people just starting out in life, going to a college campus, and I think all of us should be expect that it would be a safe campus. Now, I happen to have two granddaughters, and they have friends at the University of Minnesota, and they go down to the, um, what do they call those little groups off campus? It's been a few years. But, sororities, yeah. They go to a Christian sorority, and, uh, and they have, you know, they do Bible study and a few other things. But the point is, they do not walk uh, 
to the uh, sorority, even in daylight by themselves, they're young ladies, and at night they walk with protection from some of the young men to their car. That's where it's at, members. And I think that is something that we as the legislature can truly address. And it needs to be properly addressed in the committee on a re-referral, especially when we have to have a member here on the House floor, regardless of whether it's Republican or Democrat, have to bring an amendment to try to transfer money to try to take care of the security. And to me, besides, you know, along with tuition cost, security and the safety of the students should be the number one priority of not only ourselves, but also the college and university. So members, it's one more reason why we shouldn't be doing this on the House floor, although I appreciate Representative Scott bringing this amendment forward to highlight the need. Uh, it should be done in committee. Secondly, members, the other, if you want to address tuition, then the other thing you, that needs to be done, you need to look at the, you know, when I was on the school board, it was consistently said that 80 to 85 percent of our budget was salary and benefits, okay? 80 to 85 percent, all right? So you have to dig into that, and on these, we got 13 schools, and you have to do a comparative analysis of the types of retirement plans, health benefits, and other benefits that are given to the, to, uh, the, the professors and the administration here at the University of Minnesota. And I'll be the first to admit the University of Minnesota has been a great blessing to the state of Minnesota. You know, one of their most recent uh, developments is the winery industry and, and building grape or uh, growing grapes that can withstand our climate. And we've had a number of them pop up all across the state of Minnesota. And again, I appreciate that, but that does not negate the fact that you have to do comparative and historical analysis to keep things in check and not have these students graduating with an albatross of debt that can also cause mental and emotional problems and ruin much of their future. And the more I dig into this bill, the more I believe that we need to re-refer it to address these factors. The other thing, members, that really, if you want to get a handle on tuition, and again, I think every member on the floor, and there's getting fewer and fewer of them all the time, <laughs> um, would agree that this is not sustainable. We can't continue to see increases constantly. So what I have found when I was chief negotiator on the school board is that, you know, what happens with government money, it tends to activate three characteristics in human nature. And those three characteristics uh, can be summed up in three words. Greed, greed, and more greed. You say, why do you say that, members? This is why I say it. Because when we would get appropriation, a two-year appropriation for a settlement at the school district, if we got $200,000 of new money, by the time we settled the contracts, it was for 250 or 275,000. And in the next biennium, if we got $300,000 of money, then we settled the contracts at 350 to 375,000. So members, I used to be told as negotiator, a school board member, we need to fully fund education. And I said, you know what? I will agree with that. But how are we going to fully fund it when no matter how much money we get, we're always giving out more than what we got. So we're broke in two years. And this is the fundamental problem, not only in education, but in government in general. Every unit sits around and tries to figure out how to be broke in two years and go back down to the state and federal government and say, we're broke and we need more money. And it's contagious. It's even the other areas we give money to. Everybody tries to get rid of it and be short. 
Now, members, I was 16 years on the school board. Were you listening, Representative Erdo? <laughs> 16. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I got a lot of stories. <laughs> now they, uh, some of them I wouldn't tell on the floor, by the way. Now the, um, yeah, it's early. Yeah. Well, I hate to preach this down to two people, me and the speaker, okay? <laughs> The, um, <laughs> but, you know, members, I'd be told, let's fully fund education. And I'd say, well, how are you going to do that? I can still remember when Jesse Ventura was governor, and I was on the school board. And by the way, I played football with Jesse Ventura at North Hennepin Junior College, okay? And he would, I could tell you a few stories about that, too, but... <laughs> We'll skip that. Do you? Okay. Are you listening? Yeah. No, I still remember on the front page of the Minneapolis Tribune, because I was on the school board, they put a billion dollars of additional money into, into public education. It was during the 90s. And he stood on there, we're giving a billion dollars. And I can still remember, this is going to take care of our schools. Two years later, guess what happened? The money was all gone, and they were short again. And Jesse Ventura stood on the front page of the Star Tribune and said, public education is a black hole. You can't fully fund it. I thought, well, you figured it out, okay? So the other thing to understand, we even got a letter that time from the governor's office because we were giving out double-digit increases in salary and benefits way above what our funding was. And it basically said, what are you school board members doing in the state? You're giving settlements way above the funding that you're getting for your schools. And, you know, the problem is that under the current laws, you have an option. You either settle the contracts or you put the students out on the street in the middle of winter. What do you think most school board members are going to do? They're going to settle the contract. In fact, when I got on the school, got on negotiations, one of the members, Doug Grams, who was on negotiations before me, he said, Glenn, this is a give and take situation, negotiations. We're given and they're taken, okay? And members, if you look at the settlements when I was chief negotiator at the school, they were reasonable. We didn't have strikes. I want to pay people what they're worth. But we have to have an understanding that when government subsidies are involved, it sometimes brings out the worst perspective on human nature. So members, one of the... Oh, Representative Bernardi left the floor. Here's one less. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk louder. <laughs> um, one of the things you have to understand, when government subsidies show up in education or other areas, we need to develop a formula based upon the growth of the economy and the population. And that needs to have a governor on settlements. That's what has to happen. Now, you don't have that in the private sector because what? If a private company gives out too much salary and benefits, what happens to them? They go broken out of business. That does not happen in government. And I'm not just singling out education. It's the one I'm familiar with. I'm saying I have observed this through all government layers. And it simply creates a scenario that imbalances government salary and benefits in many cases compared to the private sector, not in all cases. So members, that needs to be done if you want to bring student debt under control. People need a governor outside themselves. Otherwise, there's no limit. One more example on that, members. You know, in 16 years on the school board and 11 years up here, in all the committee meetings and everything I've been involved with, I only had one time where somebody showed up at the committee meeting 
and wanted to give the money back that we had given him the previous year. I almost fell off the chair. It happened to be Jim Nobles. If memory serves me, we had given him a million three dollars to do some study or uh, implementation. He showed up a year or two later at the HHS committee and said, I figured out how to do it without the million three. I want to give it back. Now, I said, I raised my hand. I said, the least we should do is give him a plaque, okay? I just never heard that. Members, when have you been on a committee, Democrat or Republican, where the person coming from an organization showed up and said, we don't need any more money. In fact, we want to give some back to the state. Think about it. I've only had it happen one time. Mr. Jim Nobles, the Office of Legislative Auditor, in 27 years. Think about that, member. This is the problem with socialism. When you put government subsidy into an organization, everybody sits around and tries to figure out, not everybody, but most people, how to get that money in their pocket. And the game has come to the point where we bankrupt our, our, our government organizations, education or otherwise, and every two years we come back down to the state or the federal government and we say, we're broke, we need more money. Now, members, if you have any doubt about what I just said, please go to usdebtclock.org. And I know Representative O'Neill has referenced that already in the past. You will find, members, that we are 20, over $28 trillion in the hole. That's your checkbook, members. The federal government is $28 trillion. Remember the three things I said? Greed, greed, and more greed. That's what government subsidies produce in human nature. You know, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example in our local district. We had a road project that Senator Newman and I worked on, and thanks to uh, Representative Erdahl, got it in the bonding bill. We got, I think, $2 million for this road project for a city in my, my district. The estimated price was a little over three million. Well, about two years later, initially it was three, three million. About two years later, after we had gotten the grant, for some reason, the price went up over seven million dollars. So why do we get the two million? It more than doubled. So now we just got them another million dollars. So I'm hoping it stays at that seven million. We've got to understand that in government, when we dish out these millions and billions of dollars, we have to put governors on it. Because who supplies the money to do these things for government? Does government create wealth? Does government produce something? Remember what I said earlier, members. There's three areas. Growing something that our farmers do, that creates wealth. The second one is manufacturing something that somebody wants to buy. That's like 3M. The third way to create wealth, and we happen to be one of the wealthiest in the nation, is through mining something. That creates wealth. Everything else is shifting money around. Technology can help us do it faster, quicker, and better. That's called productivity and increase the wealth. But that's it. Government does not create wealth. Government lives off the wealth that's created by primarily the private sector. And that's why we have to put governors in place when billions of dollars go out to organizations uh, and individuals because they'll be short. 99% of them will be short in two years and they'll come back and say, we're short, we need more money. And members, it's not just for us here. It's for our children and grandchildren. If anyone in this, you know, there's economic laws. If anyone in this chamber thinks that $28 trillion of debt off the backs of our children and grandchildren and a, 
and it's 149 trillion of unfunded liabilities. That means a mortgage, 149 trillion. It's going to equal a lower standard of living for our children and grandchildren if we don't start correcting this. That's what's at stake. Not just mine, but yours also. Do you want better opportunities for your children and grandchildren? We've got to address this. Uh, again, there's economic laws, just like there's gravity, all right? You can jump off a 10-story building and believe that you're not going to fall to the ground. You're going to fall to the ground, okay? You can believe that th we can just keep doing this, uh, creating trillions of dollars out of thin air, and we're not going to have a major economic blowout in the future. I'm sorry. That's going to happen. And unfortunately, it's going to be much worse, in my opinion, and I'm pretty far down the food chain, than the 1930s Depression. All right? That's what's at stake. But members, it doesn't have to be. The other thing you need to look at as far as tuition is the cost of benefits. And members, this brings us back to one of the major benefits, and that's the cost of health care. You know, when Obamacare came out, it just didn't affect the private sector. It drove up the cost of benefits for all the government uh, la layers of government, exponentially, including your colleges and university. This is why it is so desperate that we address health care reform. And I know reinsurance isn't a long-term solution. It's a Band-Aid but it needs to be done so we don't see skyrocketing premiums going forward. Please, members, advocate for reinsurance for the next two years, not just because it's a Republican or Democrat uh, position, but it's what's good for our families and citizens in the state of Minnesota, both group and individual. Um, now I'm going to get to the bad news. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, there's several other things. Oh, members, and I wish Representative Bernardi was on the, but she wasn't going to answer anyway. She's not yielding anyway. Maybe she'd like to ask me a question. Anyway, uh, Mr. Chairman, what happened to Representative O'Neill? Oh, she's right there. I got another question. Uh, Mr. Chair, if Representative O'Neill would yield. She will yield. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, you know, one of the things I met, I have a 3M plant in our, uh, in our district in Hutchison, a very um, successful one. But one of the things when we met, uh, Senator Newman and I met, and I think uh, Representative Erdahl was there too, and their leadership said, that going forward, 65 to 70 percent of jobs are going to be in the trades, and only 30 percent are going to be in the, uh, with a college degree. Members, we had testimony when I was on the higher ed about this concern. You know, organizations like Center for the American Experiment have had articles, in fact, front page articles that said the vanishing workforce. We're in for a crisis here of not having the plumbers, the welders, and the people who actually do something, getting them replaced as we move forward. Member, uh, Representative O'Neill, was this discussed and addressed in the bill? Representative O'Neill. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen, for that question. So, you know, it's interesting. So when we were putting together the higher ed committee on the GOP side, I remember we came across Representative Mecklin's name, and I advocated really strongly for Representative Mecklin. And you heard him say that he's in the trades and that he doesn't have a college education, and he didn't know why he was on the committee. And that is exactly why we put Representative Mecklin on the committee. Now, I used to own a trades company. I used to be in the trades, too. 
It is so important. It is so incredibly important. And did we talk about it very much in committee? Well, we'd have to ask Representative Mecklen because if we talked about it, it was usually him talking about it. Is it in the bill? It isn't specifically in the bill. Although I have to say that there are some some uh, programs that I started back in 2015, like the dual training program, that gets to that. I think of like the manufacturing um, sector who really need the two-year degrees. And so the dual training is a Bueller model and it comes out of Germany. And again, I worked with Representative, or excuse me, Senator Bonoff on it. And what it is is if you're employed, say, like at a manufacturing facility, and you can go and get training to be a CNC operator, for example. And the your employer will pay half of your education and the training grants will pay the other half. And so it's a great program. And that is in here, but we did not talk about it. We, didn't, we did change a few things, but we really didn't talk about the underlying pro program very much and the success of the program or things like that. Um, it was one of my hopes in this higher ed committee this, these, this year and next year that we talk a lot about the trades, you know, talk about the plumbers and the electricians and, uh, you know, drywall guys and all of these people that need, you need to put together a home or a business and, and new construction and remodeling. They're all incredibly important. And welders, oh my goodness, we need welders so badly. So um, I think my brother's still on the floor. So Representative Daniels' son is a welder. Um, and they live down in Faribault. And he's actually hearing impaired. So welding is fantastic for him. And he is a really high-end welder. He makes really good money. He's really good with his hands. So I watched this boy grow up, right? Because uh, he was just a little young man. Uh, you know, I remember him being three, four, or five years old. And the guy was, he was like tearing apart machines and like, you know, like taking things apart and trying to figure out how they worked. So he, he's very, very mechanical. He's very... He's just like his dad, you know, his dad was a mechanic and other things. So he's just so talented um, and he is a welder. But, and he, you know, because of his hearing impairment, he told his dad once, dad, did you know I can just sit at home and, and collect social security? And his dad said to him, don't you ever, you have too much pride. And the fact of the matter is we need every single person in the workforce, right? We have about 400,000 job openings in the state of Minnesota right now. And I, I don't know how many are even in the trades, but you had said about 60% we need. So just think about maybe 60% and we don't have the people to fill that. We literally need every single person that is able-bodied to be out and working. So we had just little smidgens of conversation in the higher ed committee about trades and about how important they are and our technical colleges that do such a great job. And I think we're going to have some members come after to talk about some of the, the technical colleges in their univers and universities in their districts and how incredibly important they are. And my concern in this bill is that Men's State is really underfunded. And that will have a direct impact on the state of Minnesota and training up exactly who it is we need in the workforce, because we need those trade guys. And there's a little bit about apprenticeship in here, but very little. There's a little bit about the dual training, but very little. But these are all things that I had hoped that we would talk about at great length. My family is, uh, you know, multifaceted. You, my brother, Representative Daniels, talked a little bit about our other brother who started as a mechanic and now he works up at Marvin Windows. And we're, we have a lot of diversity in our family. We have another brother that's a helicopter pilot who's married to a helicopter mechanic. And I always said, joke to my brother, I said, do not tick off your wife. <laughs> he did crash a few times, but it had nothing to do with her. But in any case, so, you know, we need a diverse workforce and we need everybody in the workforce. And unfortunately, we barely started that conversation in committee. It's something that I hope we talk more about. And I hope Representative Becklin really, you know, steps up and really speaks more about it. And honestly, that's why we put you, Representative Mecklen, on the committee, because we wanted to talk more about the trades. And, you know, when I did an analysis just of my county out in Wright County, and only about 30% of our workforce has a bachelor's degree or higher. Only 30%. So there are all kinds of people that are working and are employed and doing great things, and they don't have a bachelor's degree. Or I mean, only 30% have a bachelor's degree. But there's all kinds of them that have maybe a two-year degree or a training certificate or something else. So 
yeah, I mean, if you look at just your statistic in my county alone, we need a lot of people that have two-year degrees and certifications. My own daughter, when I think about it, she just finished Dunwoody in the middle. <laughs> she finished just before the pandemic hit in full force, and she's a frontline healthcare worker. So she got her RTR, so that's a radiologist technician. And she started at Methodist Hospital in St. Louis Park. Well, of course, that was the epicenter of the pandemic. And this, the, <laughs> she was living with me in March when the pandemic hit. And we quickly had to move her down to her apartment down in, uh, in South Minneapolis, which is a whole other story later in the summer, as you recall. But, you know, she actually did an ROI on how much it would take. Remember you talked about how expensive college is? So she did an ROI on how much it would cost her to get the degree, get the licensure, get the certification, and then what she would make in that profession. And it was of all the things that interested her, it had the highest ROI. So she went and she got her two-year degree and she immediately started working as an RTR. And then she, so as a radiologist technician, and then she moved up to be a CAT scan technician. So this poor child was working as a CAT scan technician at the beginning of COVID. So what I found out is that if you're a radiologist, you can look at uh, uh, an image, a CAT scan image of someone's lungs and instantly know if they have COVID. And so she was scanning every single person that came into the ER. So working 12 hour shifts, just nonstop. She was going as fast as she possibly could and still not keeping up. But she has that two year degree and it's incredibly important. We need so many, so we need, you know, in the medical field, we need people like that. In manufacturing, we need people. In the trades, we need people with two-year degrees. So, so I would love to talk about this at great length in the higher ed committee, and unfortunately, we just did not talk that much about it. So um, I'm really hoping Representative Mecklen really steps it up this next semester, or, ne or this next uh, session, and really talks about the trades a little bit more. So thank you, Representative Grunhagen, for the question. Representative Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Representative Mecklen, your name has been mentioned uh, three or four times just recently as far as this uh, trades education. Would you like to make a few comments? If he would yield? He will yield. Representative Grunhagen. Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, while you were all talking, I, you, you brought something to mind, uh, Representative O'Neill. Two years ago, we, maybe three, we were in Monticello at the Workforce Trade Center. I don't generally recall the gentleman, there was somebody who was presenting to us and he was talking about two or four years prior to that, because it's, it's a about every year event or something, that they were promoting that the, the, the market was gonna need 66% of the people to have a four year degree. And in the, whatever the time frame was, they have done a complete 180, that it's now two. While I do say a lot of people can go straight into the trades, I will, actually I was thinking about this. In the, particularly the trade side of things, one of the things we see is either the person is really, really good at the trade and they're not so good at the business side, or they're really good at the business side but need a little help on the trade side. This is where these two year or certificate parts can come in very, very good because uh, it, it is a lot to understand. And typically your average trade guy never knows when to quit working and then they burn the midnight oil and they don't get any sleep and they kind of get behind on paperwork. And then you learn about this guy named Uncle Sam and that gets even more ugly. Um, you know, there, there's, when, 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 uh, when, when, when Sammy came around, I think I, maybe I told you that, but these jobs are all um, shifting and I'm seeing them, I just read another article where they're shifting away from the need and going to work experience, life experience, and, and you listen to the many experiences down here. I mean, someone I know just has had a, was sat on a school board for 16 years. And, you know, I was also thinking, there was a professor from SCSU, St. Cloud State, that used to, I, I talked to quite a bit, he's retired now. And he was the aviation pr professor um, there. And he constantly expressed frustration why they got rid of that program. And, um, you know, he, what he observed, I think he also taught it down in Mankato, if I'm not mistaken. What I see in my district, which is kind of becoming more and more of an anomaly, is that because SESU is getting rid of more and more things, he would actually send me pictures of posters that were on the, on the, on the hallway walls within the, in the, within the college there. 
And it was focusing more on social programs and not so much on the degrees that gave you a good paying job. So what we're seeing now more and more, at least in my area, which we always kind of thought Sammy would go to St. Cloud State because it's right there. She would commute and it's a 10 minute drive. Um, yeah, that's not gonna happen anymore, by the way. So I was gonna highlight something. I gotta think of his name, Dylan uh, Raduz, R-A-D-U-Z. He ended up going to North Dakota State University and this young man's particular thing, just a, I don't know, maybe Representative Wolgamott heard about it. It was kind of big news locally. He, he, was, he went there on their football program. He was just drafted by the Tennessee Titans. And they were the second or third round. He actually went to school in Becker. Um, a, a really, really big thing. Um, and talking about some of these different trade level jobs, you know, we have a, a very unique uh, trucking company in Becker, Minnesota. Their highest paid trucker is $280,000 a year. Think about that. As he put it, this is a very big man, self-made. He built this company from a ground up. I remember, I'm trying to think of the word. He said like the worst lackey he has, the guy barely shows up, is 80. Think about that. Now, what's interesting about him, his longest trailer is 400 feet. That is eight, over eight, well, a little less than eight times longer than your standard semi-trailer. He hauls things that are 400 tons and doesn't even think about it. He showed me a packet. It was a run from like Chicago to maybe South Carolina. It was like a 900 mile run. It was all the permits for all the townships and all the things and it was literally that thick. And the cost of that one run was 66 grand. But the amount of municipalities they got to work through and make sure they have it all right is pretty crazy. Talk about regulation, but that's a whole nother story. Then I'm going to talk about another interesting one. Um, I don't know. Is Representative Fu Lee here? I'm not going to ask him to yell. I'm just curious if he's here. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe somebody on the other side of the aisle can convey my message I'm about to give. So <clears throat> another interesting thing. We recently had a, a company move to Becker. Um, it's called Northern Metals. That's why I was curious if Representative Lee was here. Northern Metals is an interesting thing. I mean, you know, there's a lot of back, back history in Minneapolis. I'm gonna, we'll debate that another day. However, the interesting thing about Northern Metals, they've, they've been highlighted at least by one, and it's about to be two of these national cable shows because what they have created is the world's most advanced and technologically advanced recycling center anywhere in the world. Nothing like it exists. It is, and if you ever want to tour it, that's why I was hoping Representative Lee would be here because I'm going to invite him to tour this thing and I will host the tour. They have computers and technology and robotics in this thing. We just had a tour with the robotics kids because who, what better person to bring there, right? They're trying to figure out what they're going to do. We brought 10th graders, 9th and 10th. Figured the seniors already made up their mind. So I just want to highlight that the lowest paid person that works there currently that's a toss-up. The person who takes little cans out of grandma's trunk starts at just over $40,000 a year plus full benefits. Anybody operating equipment is pushing six figures. There's a young man that started there four years ago that uh, he had a very severe insecurity complex. He stutters incredibly horrible, right? And the more he stutters, the more he melts down and whatever. So the, one of their managers took this as a personal challenge. He actually graduated from Becker High School, Representative Howard. You're missing your reunion tonight, by the way. Um, it's okay, I missed a few things too. <clears throat> anyway, in four years from a kid coming out of high school, he did the pop can thing, that's where he started. He had to make, you know, pay him out. He is now making just under 80 grand a year in four years. Kind of what Callie just said was I was telling her about it. Like, what was I thinking? I mean, this is the guy who has this little crane thing. There were six plus figures. The point of this is there are really, really good jobs out there um, that I, I wish more people would realize. Uh, you know, you don't have to wear these uncomfortable ties all the time, which I'm not today because it was so bad yesterday. But yeah, maybe you get a little hot sometimes. Maybe you get a little dirty sometimes. But I tell you what, if you ever tour this place, you'll go, this stuff is really cool. There's a table. It sorts every metal. Every machine does something different. 
Now think about separating little pieces of copper from brass, from gold, from aluminum, because none of it's magnetic. Each table does its own thing. What's interesting about this, this table's probably as long as this little run here, but about this wide, and he'll say, that one's a million six. So was that one, that one, that one, and that one. The little shorter ones that do something a little bit different, yeah, they're only 860,000. They built this thing, basically, they bought like the tranny from Germany and the engine from uh, Brazil, and they hired all these special engineers. These engineers, by the way, were, what did he tell me, like $2,800 an hour or something like that? Get an engineering job if there's any kids going to college. I always say HVAC, too, because HVAC guys make way too much money. Not that electricians don't, by the way, just so you're, you're good. So, <clears throat> yes, um, I, I, this is a very, very important thing, and if people aren't aware, we constantly talk about a lack of affordable housing. If I go to my lumber yard right now, it's full. They, they, don't, they don't take public customers anymore. So people go in and go, why can't you sell me? It's full. Problem is, it's all paid for. It's waiting to be delivered to the job site. They can't deliver it to the job site. I don't know if you've seen the price of lumber, but right now it's better than a catalytic converter. So I've seen many of jokes. I should part my house out because it'd be worth a lot of money. In fact, speaking of how much wood is, when Sammy was born, we built this, well, not born, but when we moved, this playset from Menards. It was two grand, 2,200 bucks. It was biggest wine as a kit. You gotta spend a whole weekend putting it together. She doesn't play with it anymore. I put it on Facebook Marketplace, three minutes, it was gone, two grand. Guy came out the next day, I said, hey, I got a forklift, I'll help you pick it up, we'll do it in pieces, you take it apart, because you gotta know how to put it back together, it was gone. That's pretty good. So, the lumber is still there. The reason the lumber is still there, because there's no labor to put it together. They cannot deliver it, because you know within a matter of days, the lumber will be gone. Because the only labor will show up is putting it in their own truck and leaving with it. There's not enough people working anymore. There's not enough people going to the trades. There's not enough people who are willing to even get off their butt, especially because of stupid $300 unemployment. And this has to be fixed. I have heard, you know, different people say they don't believe this has any effect on it. I don't know. Um, I, think, I think, well, he moved. Representative Frankie has got the same problems. Our McDonald's has literally two people. It's a 45-minute wait to get anything from the Becker McDonald's. It, it just blows my mind. So, yeah, I'm pretty, uh, Representative Grunegan, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. I'm kind of sick and tired of seeing things go out of state. It's obvious we're pushing our energy out of state. We're pushing our students out of state. Where is it going to end? Get back to teaching the fundamentals and um, get them a degree that's worth money if that's what they really, really need. Or get them into a job where they can make money. You know, actually, I was almost done. Just remind me of a story. Sorry. October 12th, it's funny, Friday, I remember this, right? October 12th of 2018, I met a young man. He was 23 years old. And he was telling me that all his friends went to college. He had about a one-year-old Chevy pickup crew cab short box. He, he was a welder, because you mentioned welders. And he was making $32 an hour with all the overtime he can get. So that's over 65 grand at regular time. And the highlight of his story was, within that week, he was closing on his first home. And most of his friends were still finishing up college. That same year was kind of, I th you all met my pastor two years ago, if you remember him. He was uh, the chaplain for the 34th Aviation Brigade Red Devils. Uh, Representative Heinrich remembers him. It was uh, quite, he had a quite an interesting, interesting little thing he did. Everybody laughed. We always do a thing for the graduating class. And then he asked each one of them, we give them a quilt that all the gals make. And then they asked, he asked each one of them what they're going to do. One of the young men said he's going to be a welder, and so Pastor Darrell said, what does that pay? I kid you not, the kid turned around and said, hell of a lot more than your job. <laughs> that had the church actually laughing. So it is something that, you know, amongst many other things that I'm pretty passionate about and I care about, I hope that uh, we can focus on this more and keep driving this home and, and keep digging into why colleges keep taking more money, and I don't know, I have a lot of theory on it, but research, I guess. You know, it seems to me ever since the Fed's kind of guaranteed all these loans and you can't file bankruptcy, it keeps getting more expensive, they keep putting kids in more debt, and then kids complain that they need the debt forgiven, but now they get 300 bucks a week to, not, to go not work, so I think we need a lot of things, that's why we need to re-refer this, because it's clearly not there yet, it's not ready for prime time, so thank you, Representative Grunhagen. 
The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Nice to see you up there again. The, um, uh, you know, members, there is a bright spot here, and some of it's in my district. Maybe it's happening in your district. You could check out. But in uh, the Hutchison School, they have developed a trades uh, education for students who want to go that direction. They can actually graduate from high school, and I know Representative Erdahl has toured this too, uh, right out of high school without debt and get a job at, with a local business like 3M or other businesses, and they can start at $60,000, $70,000 a year with benefits. So there is these things going on. To the degree that we can facilitate things like this, I think we should look into it. And evidently, based on the testimony of uh, Representative Mecklen and also Representative O'Neill, that wasn't done to, a, to the degree that the crisis that's coming that actually justifies. And it's another reason I'm beginning to become convinced this bill needs to go back to committee. And uh, Madam Speaker, you know, one of the reasons I asked Representative or Chairman uh, Bernardi to uh, yield was to give her a chance. I'm always a firm believer in hearing two sides to every story. While there's been a lot of accusations here, uh, both in, during my testimony and by others, and I wanted her to have a chance to respond to some of that in terms of her bill so that we can get both sides of the story. Otherwise, uh, I don't see how we have any choice but to vote green to, to, to refer this back to the uh, committee. So, Madam Chair, would Representative uh, Bernardi yield and want to respond to some of those comments? She will not yield, Representative Grunhagen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Madam Chair, would she like to ask me a question? No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm open to questions. Criticism and otherwise. You know, criticism keeps you humble, members. That's one of the reasons politicians get criticized, to keep us humble. Okay, um, okay back to uh, the bill. Okay, members, if we want to address this crisis of tuition, these are the types of things that have to be looked at. Comparative and historical in terms of other conference schools. Moving tuition for in-state students to a better position among the 13 schools than our outstate and foreign students, especially when their parents are paying the taxes in to, take, to subsidize the University of Minnesota. And uh, that's how we get at this, members, okay? Again, I wasn't on the higher ed committee. I've served in the past, and these are some of the things that I've learned and uh, think we should move forward on. We cannot, if anybody in their right mind believes that the current system is sustainable ad nauseum, go visit a shrink. It's not, okay? We can't sustain the amount of debt we're creating. We can't sustain the tuition increases. And for God's sake, we can't keep graduating students with, little, with a very small chance of a uh, of an opportunity to improve their lives with $400,000 you know, $400, of debt, the example that I gave you. Please, let's care about them and get to the bottom of this and not just keep piling more and more money every two years onto the same system that the money disappears and, the, and we need more the next two years. No matter your political persuasion, a red flag should go up in your mind when you see that. Uh, with that, Madam Speaker. Pardon? Oh, uh, 
Madam Speaker, I would like uh, Representative uh, or Leader Dow to yield, if he would, to comment on this. And I'd specifically like to have you address the unemployment issue and how it's affecting employment in the state and the hourly wage that actually comes out. Representative Dow, would you yield to a question? I will. He will yield. Representative Dow. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I want to talk about the unemployment issue, um, but as you know, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit first about why it's so important that this bill goes back to, uh, to the committee, uh, frankly. Um, I think we've talked the last couple of days a lot about the fact that uh, members who come here to the legislature specialize um, in these committees, and, and uh, I, for one, am a believer that a member who comes here who gets to work on the issues that they care about will be a passionate member and, a, and will be a better member of the legislature. Um, and, 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 you know, I told that story a little bit yesterday um, because it's the leaders of the, of the caucuses that gets to kind of choose which members are on which committees. And, of course, members request and we try to uh, meet those needs. Um, but the reality is uh, it's... What struck me after I talked about that and then I thought about what we're doing here is why would we prevent those members from working on those issues? If we go through all that trouble, why would we prevent them from working on the issues that they care about? Uh, and, and so, you know, that's why these bills need to go to the committees of jurisdiction um, so that the members that, that really care about these issues get a chance to vet them. I think if we looked through this bill, I probably have a copy of it somewhere. Will you hand me that folder right there? Um, you know, if you look through this bill, you're going to find that uh, these bills have a lot of language in them that relates to a lot of different, uh, different things. This particular bill, House File 7, has... 18 lines of just references of things that it touches in statute. Um, this bill actually is, is smaller than most um, because we passed a lot of the, uh, um, oh no, I'm sorry, we didn't. The Ag Bill is the one we passed the, the policy. Um, this one actually, uh, this one actually uh, has the policy and the, and the uh, finance provisions in it. Um, but if you look at a bill of this size, you know, this particular bill is 71 pages, and then it has a couple of, uh, three pages of appendix on the back of it. Um, this is a bill where, you know, it, it didn't get a single hearing in the Committee of Jurisdiction. Um, I think you've heard numerous members talk today about the fact that this bill, Madam Speaker, just a little loud in here. Maybe we could just quiet the chamber a little bit. Madam Speaker, point of order. I don't, I don't know. The, Representative Grunhagen, state uh, your point of order. Uh, it's a little bit loud if people could uh, take their conversations outside the House floor. I think you've accomplished your point of order, Representative Dowd. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, anyways, as I was saying, you know, this bill 71 pages. There's three pages of appendix. Um, and this bill did not have a hearing in the Committee of Jurisdiction. So the members of the committee and the members of the legislature that specialize in um, higher education um, didn't get a chance to look at this bill, didn't get a chance to have input in what's in this bill, didn't get a chance to vet the provisions um, that are contained within this bill, didn't get a chance to check for punctuation and spelling. Um, and really, didn't get a chance to use their expertise. So I'm afraid, you know, if we, if we think that it's efficient to use our time here on the House floor as a committee of the whole doing committee work, um, this sort of thing is what committees do. Look through these bills and look for punctuation problems and errors in numbers and, you know, mundane things like take public testimony from people that would be impacted by this, you know, just little things like that. 
and I don't know, I, I wasn't able to, to read through this entire bill as I was some of the other ones to figure out what it is that Democrats are trying to hide from the public in this one. But uh, sounds like the, the, uh, the other members here know full well what those things are. But the reality is these bills, you know, and we laugh and we joke because it's kind of funny. We make little jokes here. But what we do here is not funny. And making a mockery of the process is not funny. And violating the House rules because we want to quickly speed something through because there's some emergency that we pass this tonight or yesterday when we have two weeks left of session and we could send this to committee and let the members who care about these issues and are passionate about these issues work on these issues. And we could invite experts from our higher education institutions in to actually give us input on this bill. It's very disrespectful to the professionals that work in our higher education institutions to not let them be a part of this process. To not let them come in and testify about this bill and have their input. But we've let two people again in a, in a smoky back room, dark of night, uh, cone of silence, you know, what are all the terms we've used? Behind closed doors, secret. And unfortunately, that doesn't serve Minnesotans. So Republicans have spent a few hours, almost 28 hours, in the last two days, trying to shine just a little bit of light on a process that needs to be fixed. Because there isn't anybody in Minnesota that is falling for the line that we need to pass this bill or that somehow Republicans are holding up the budget. That's laughable. The fact is that Democrats during the regular session couldn't compromise and didn't get their work done on time. So here we are. And now we are expected to just forget about the process and forget about the public and forget about transparency and rush these bills through with a moment's notice and nobody knowing what's going on with two people negotiating this and appearing before the tribunal. By the way, the tribunal is alive and well, I, sure, I assure you, and I can say that as a personal testimony of the fact that I witnessed it and participated in it today. I had no idea that's what I was doing. I thought I was getting invited to a leaders meeting between the four legislative leaders and the governor. And I tuned in promptly at 1.30. That was the time I was invited on. And sure enough, the other legislative leaders and the governor were on the Zoom. And they asked the two uh, minority leaders if they had some opinions and things that they thought we needed to accomplish before the end of session. I felt very included and very respected. And I, uh, because I'm respectful, asked if Senator Kent would like to go first, and she did. She talked for a few minutes, and then it was my turn. And I said, you know what? My caucus's priority is reinsurance. And we're committed to making sure that 165,000 Minnesotans don't see a 30% increase in their health insurance rates. So that's what we care about. And that's why we're standing on the floor for 28 hours talking because we want to save a reinsurance program that actually helps Minnesotans. So I spoke for about 20 minutes and I went back and forth with uh, Commissioner Showalter a little bit who, you know, I didn't, I, I've known Commissioner Showalter for a while. I got to know him when he was commissioner the first time. Then he went to the uh, uh, private sector and, and worked uh, for the health plans actually. Um, and I joked with him and said, Commissioner, I can't you know, really let this go without making a little joke about the fact that uh, if you were still in your previous job, you'd be on my side of this issue right now. Um, he got a little laugh out of that. And then he continued to talk about, uh, you know, the, 
conservative numbers he was using to discredit reinsurance. And, and I said, you know what, I, I've, I've done this too long to allow you to engage me in a game of death by fiscal note. Um, and I said, you know what, your fiscal note doesn't really matter in this case. So you can uh, inflate all of the costs and take all of the worst case scenarios and it doesn't matter. Because this program is already in statute 100% fully scalable. So we can take whatever estimate that we feel comfortable with, we can appropriate that amount of dollars towards it, and if the money isn't enough and we were wrong in our estimates, the MSHA board will change the attach points and scale this program back to provide just exactly the benefit that we can afford. So I said, doesn't really matter. We don't need to play a game today of death by fiscal note. Because um, the, the administration has certainly engaged in that over the years. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I've been able to sniff that out. I'm, I'm on to the game. Um, which is exactly why we created our uh, nonpartisan uh, budget office now that uh, exists over in the legislature. Um, much like the Congressional Budget Office. To pull that away from the administration. So anyways, after 20 minutes on the... Uh, the call, the legislative uh, leader's call with the governor, um, I made my case and then uh, they promptly said to me, well, thank you, we'll take that under advisement. Have a nice day. And I thought to myself, I must be the biggest ass in St. Paul right now because what I just participated in was the tribunal that nobody thought existed and everybody said wasn't happening. But they're there. I met before them today. So three people are making decisions about what's going into these bills. Three people. Not the people who are on the Higher Education Committee. Not the people who care about these issues. Not the people who run our higher education institutions. Not the students and the parents of students that are impacted by the decisions that we're making. Nope. Three people. By the way, who don't specialize in these issues and don't really know a lot about them. And I'll assure you that when I was on that call with the tribunal today, the governor was on that call. Yesterday? Was this yesterday? I apologize. You know what? This is so, what we're doing here on the House floor is so exciting that my day actually ran together. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for correcting me. It was yesterday. Yesterday. But nonetheless, the governor was on that call. So the governor is participating in the tribunal, and I assume that means that the same rules that are in place two years ago for the tribunal are in place now. Uh, for those following along at home, uh, that was number seven on the signed agreement by the legislative leaders and the governor from the last day of session, the one that is unconstitutional and says that the governor can veto legislation uh, before it gets uh, actually even passed in the legislature. Yep, that one. Um, if I was Speaker of the House, that would never happen, and it should never happen. Uh, but nonetheless, those are the people that are making the decision on what's in these bills. Not the members who have sacrificed hours and days away from their families and their jobs and their livelihoods to be here to specialize in these issues, who care about these issues and are passionate about these issues. They've been locked out prevented from being involved in the process. And why, might you ask? Because Democrats don't want anybody to find out that their number one demand has been that we raise health insurance costs by 30% for 165,000 Minnesotans. And that's the truth. They want the reinsurance program to go away. They want that instability back in the marketplace. They want those $13,000 deductibles and $3,000 month premiums that nobody can afford. So they can force people into a program called Minsure, where, by the way, they'll still have 30% increases in their health care rates. But you know what? If you buy your insurance through Minsure, our state government gets to siphon 3.5% off for themselves. Yeah? And that's why we fight for Minnesotans today on the House floor and yesterday on the House floor. To protect them from the damage that this Democrat governor and Democrats in the Minnesota House 
are hell-bent on inflicting on them. And we ask them, what's your idea? How would you solve the health care problem? Well, we're just going to let this go away. We don't really have an idea of what we'd put in its place. We'll start by just increasing health insurance rates by 30% on Minnesotans. Not just any Minnesotans, but the minority immigrant small business owners right here in St. Paul that can't afford to pay these increases. And nobody seems to care. But I assure you in that dark back room, somebody's actually trying to trade your future, your health insurance, your family's security to get something else. Rumors today that They've traded, they're, they're trying to trade things for a bridge a mile and a half long over Highway 94. The Rondo Bridge over Highway 94, a project that would, at its best, probably cost a billion dollars and transport no one. While bridges in your community crumble and fall and potholes don't get filled, a billion dollars for a bridge over Highway 94. a mile and a half long. I will tell you, that has to be the single stupidest idea I have ever heard of in St. Paul. And believe me, I have seen some doozies because I'm in the Minnesota legislature. I have seen some doozies over the year. But a bridge for a mile and a half long over Highway 94 in St. Paul? For a billion dollars, if you're lucky. They're saying, oh no, it's only going to be 600 million. I bet when you're done, it's 2 billion. And I guarantee, I am not kidding you, the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. And what problem you think you're going to solve with that? I, unbelievable. Good news, I'm sure that that one was so stupid it was just another one of the rumors that banter around this place at the end of session. It can't be real. There's no chance anybody would be that stupid. So let's forget about it. It can't be real. But it'll be entertaining if it shows up here on the House floor in a bill, and I guarantee you I'll have a few amendments for that. And all of that happening while we're actually considering letting insurance rates for Minnesota families who already struggle to afford their health insurance go up by 30%. And somehow that would be okay. And we don't spend all of our time working on that. One of the most successful programs at stabilizing insurance rates and making insurance more affordable for more Minnesotans that this state has ever seen. We were the first state in the country to do it. We did it under a Republican-led House when I was Speaker of the House. It was so groundbreaking that 13 other states have done it. In fact, I heard on the House floor here that North Dakota actually just made it permanent in their law because it works. Amy Klobuchar, She's been a supporter of this concept for a long time and a very outspoken proponent. Amy Klobuchar, you know, that conservative bastion. Well, she agrees with the Star Tribune editorial board that this program works and it's effective. And those of you who are watching this at home should ask yourselves, why is it that Democrats are insistent that that program go away? A few days ago, one of them said to me, there's no way. That program is way too expensive. It costs way too much money. The state and federal money that goes into it, divided by the number of people that it helps, divided by two years, 860 bucks per person. That's a lot of money. I want to know how much that bridge over the, the, the uh, Highway 94 is going to cost per person. Because I'd, like I'd, I'd like to know the difference. 
If you think keeping health insurance rates affordable and keeping Minnesotans on health insurance so their family can have security and spending $865 on that, if you think that's too expensive but somehow think a two, one or two billion dollar bridge over the, over the highway in St. Paul is okay, you need to have your head checked. Or better yet, retire and find something else to do. Because this isn't the place for you. Minnesotans have elected you to come here and do your job, to represent them. And if they ever find out that that's actually the truth, oh my gosh. I'm trying to figure out just as I stand here how many seats over there Republicans are going to have after the next election. And you know what? Remember this moment. Because this is the time that I gave you an out and I said don't do anything that stupid. Remember this moment. Because this is the moment I'm going to thank you for the day after the election when we're moving all your name tags off those desks over there. Because you are giving this chamber away by being so terrible at your job. Because you would put a bridge for a mile and a half over Highway 94, over the security of families to actually be able to afford health insurance. Think about that. Because that's what you're doing. And so folks who are watching at home, and I know they are, glued to their televisions. They are watching what you're doing. And the press is reporting what you're doing. And tomorrow morning, when everybody wakes up, they're going to say, you know what? What Representative Doubt was talking about on the House floor, that had to have been a bad dream. There's no way those things could have been true. And you know what? It's going to be up to you to determine when they wake up tomorrow morning whether it was a bad dream or not. It's up to you. Because I assure you, if the things that I talked about tonight come true, you're the ones who are going to be waking up the morning after the election wishing you would have just had a bad dream. But you're going to deserve the fate you get for making stupid decisions like that. Representative Grunhagen, what was your question? Representative Doubt, uh, Representative Grunhagen holds the floor. He can ask you a question. You can yield to his question. You can't ask him a question back. Are you ceding the floor to Representative Grunhagen? Yeah, I just was letting him know I don't remember what his question was. If he'd wanted no, to ask me another seeing. one, All I'd right. be happy to answer it. Okay. Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, just part of the question was uh, you had shared in caucus. You know, I think there's 20 or 25 states that have sent the $300 of unemployment benefits back to the federal government. Okay, maybe even 30 states. And you had shared statistically, or a total dollar amount with the $300, the hourly wage that we're actually paying people to stay home with unemployment benefits, and why it's part of the crisis of filling jobs in the state of Minnesota. So if you'd like to respond to that, uh, Madam Speaker, if he would yield. He will yield. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I got to tell you, I completely missed the question again because my colleague here was just telling me, was this today in Ways and Means? That can't be true. Tell Representative Doubt that the Rondo Land Bridge was amended into the Workforce Bill, House File 1, in Ways and Means today. Coming to the General Register. Madam Speaker, I have nothing else to say. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Okay, uh, I'll just try to wrap this up. And uh, just, I want to give you two more examples how government subsidies corrupt human behavior and decisions, okay? Uh, the other day, Representative uh, Nash shared on the House floor that he was on the board of a college. And the college looked at uh, providing certain types of electricity and energy to their college. And they looked at 
solar on the college. They looked at wind, if I remember right, and geothermal. And when they looked at all three, they decided geothermal was the most uh, dependable and cost effective. But now, members, we want to pass a bill in Commerce Committee to subsidize colleges and universities to put solar on their, on their buildings. So see how government subsidy corrupts human behavior? They don't do what's economically viable. They start making choices based upon getting the money of government subsidy. I'll give you one last example because this is so important that you understand this about human nature. Uh, you know, as I, when I was on the school board, <laughs> one more time, um, race to the top came to our school district under Obama. Under Obama. And we were going to get $300,000 to hire five FTEs one time. So uh, FTE is a full-time employee. So I renamed it. Rather than race to the top, I renamed it race off an academic and financial cliff, okay? Because what you're doing, you're taking one-time money and creating ongoing expenses. What's going to happen after you spend the $300,000 on five FTEs? I got two minutes left, Representative Weekly. The <laughs> it's gone and you still have the expenses. You know, I, I shared at the school board meeting, the quickest way to go bankrupt in life is to take one-time money and create ongoing expenses. I sure hope you, when you vote for this, some, and it was split, it just passed by one vote. I said, when you vote for this, I sure hope you don't do your personal finances this way because you're gonna be bankrupt. It's a dumb way to operate. So this is the problem with what the money we give out. We have to build guardrails and accountability. And with that, uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Winkler, I will uh, end my comment. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that House File 7 be laid on the table. Representative Winkler moves that House File 7 be laid on the table. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those aye. opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 11 a.m. Saturday, June 19th, 2021. Representative Winkler moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 11 a.m. Saturday, June 19th, 2021. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Winkler moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, Aye. please say no. Aye. The motion prevails. The House stands adjourned Aye. until 11 a.m. Saturday, June 19th, 2021.